Trigonometry looks at triangles, but specifically the measure of the angles of those triangles. So the important foundational question as we get started with trig is how do we measure angles? And the most common way angles are measured, the one you're probably most familiar with, is in degrees. The idea is, if I've got a circle on this coordinate plane here, and this circle goes around like so. I can't draw very good circles. Sorry. Uh, we'll start on the far right, and we'll call that 0 degrees. And because somebody decided once, we're going to say circles have a total of 360 degrees. So if I go all the way around the circle back to my original point, we'll be at 360 degrees. And one of the reasons 360 was chosen is we could divide 360 by a lot of things and not have a remainder. We can divide by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10. We can divide by a lot of things and not have a remainder. So if I were to divide it in half, halfway around the circle then must be 180 degrees. And half of that then would be 90 degrees. And if I go between 180 and 360, that would be 270 degrees. Another way that we've divided up the circle is we can divide each of these halves into thirds. And so we've got thirds that come out of the circle to points. And these are going to be some common angles that we're going to work with as well. And 1 third of 90 degrees is 30 degrees. So each one of these is going to be 30 more degrees. So it goes 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, which we already have, 210, 240, 270, which we already have, 300, and then 330. And finally, 360, which we already have. Now, each 90 could have been split into thirds, but it could have also been split in halves. And so we're also going to have some common angles that are just going to be in the middle, the halves. Half of 90 is 45 degrees. And so counting every 45, we've got 45. 90 on top, 135 degrees, 180 on the left, 225, 270 on the bottom, 315, and finally 360. And so you, these are going to be what we're going to call the common angles that we're going to work with a lot in this course. And you should be very familiar with where they're located on the circle, how many degrees gives you each position on the coordinate plane. Now, the neat thing about degrees in a circle is we can actually spin around the circle several times and end up back at the same spot. So I'm going to number this circle, this unit circle number one. The number two thing we want to talk about with degrees is these things called coterminal angles. Coterminal angles, terminal means end, and co means the same. Coterminal angles end at the same place. So if we take this little 30 degree angle here, that 30 degree angle opens up 30 degrees. But we could have also said we're going to open up all the way around the circle 360, and then an additional 30. That's going to give us a 390 degree angle. Notice to go around the circle, we got an extra 360. By adding 360, we ended up back at the same place. But we could also go backwards. You notice that all of our angles have opened. And this might be worth noting, all of our angles on this circle, we always open counterclockwise. Counterclockwise is going to be how we measure positive angles. So if we go backwards, always starting from the far left, 
going backwards, we're going to call that a negative angle. So if 360 is all the way around, 360 minus 30 is negative 330 degrees, gets us to the same ending for that angle, that coterminal angle. So in summary, we can find coterminal angles by either adding or subtracting. Let's just say add or subtract 360 degrees. So for example, if I have a 1,200 degree angle, I could find a coterminal angle with it by subtracting 360 degrees. And that would give me 840 degrees. So 840 and 1,200 are coterminal angles. In fact, I could subtract 360 degrees again, and I would get 480 degrees. And I could subtract 360 again, and that will give us our first angle that's between 0 and 360 of 120 degrees. And what we see is 120 degrees, 480 degrees, 840 degrees, 1,200 degrees. All four of these are all the same coterminal angle. We could even work with a negative number and do a very similar thing. Let's say we've got a negative 800 degree angle. And I want to know what's that equivalent to within that 0 to 360 range, just one rotation of the circle. Well, since this is negative, we're going to add 360 degrees. And that'll give us negative 440 degrees. And if I add 360 again, that'll give me another coterminal angle of negative 80 degrees. And if I add 360 again, we get our first coterminal angle that's between 0 and 360. This is a 280 degree angle. And again, all three of these, negative 800, negative 440, negative 80, all four actually, and the 280 degree angle, all three are all the same coterminal angles. One use of angles and angle measurement in degrees in this case is helping us determine the arc length on a circle. What we're going to do is we're going to use Greek letters to represent angles in this course. So this Greek letter, it's a circle with a line through the center, is the Greek letter theta. If we took theta and divided it by 360, that would give us the proportion of the entire circle that angle covers. And so if we're looking for the arc length, which our textbook uses the letter s, that would be equal to a full arc length, the full circumference of the circle. And the formula for circumference, you should remember from your geometry days, is 2 times the radius times pi. And that's the circumference, or the distance around. So if we have a circle with radius of 3 inches, and the angle of 114 degrees, we should be able to find the arc length that that covers. What I mean by that is we've got a circle. The radius is 3, and there's some 114 degree angle in here. And we want to know how long is that arc that covers that 114 degree angle. And this proportion helps us do it. It's a part over the whole. We have an angle of 114 degrees out of the total 360 degrees. That's equal to the arc length over the total length around the circle, which is 2 times the radius of 3 times pi. Well, to solve for the arc length, the s that we want will multiply by 2 times 3 is 6 pi on both sides. 
leaving just the arc length on the right side. And I'd probably put this in my calculator, leaving the pi, because we always like to leave the exact answer in terms of pi whenever possible. 6 times 114 divided by 360 is going to give us 1.9. So our arc length is 1.9 pi inches. Not too bad there. Now, we've been talking about degrees so far, because degrees is what you're probably most familiar with. However, it's actually a very inconvenient way to measure circles, because the 360 was kind of abstractly decided that 360 is the distance all the way around the circle. Well, who decided that? Well, someone who just decided it was easy to do math with 360. It's much better to use a method that uses the circle we're talking about. So we're going to often in this course, more often than degrees, talk about these things called radians. And this is an angle measured in terms of the radius. And so again, we're going to redraw that circle we started with. I'm going to draw it a little bigger this time just so that we can see what's happening really clearly. So we've got this circle. It's perfectly round. And the idea is we know that the circumference of a circle, the distance all the way around the circle, is 2 pi times the radius. Well, the radius is going to be our unit of measure. So we're going to say the distance around the circle is 2 pi times whatever the radius is. So all the way around the circle, then, we're going to call that 2 pi radians, or 2 pi times the distance of the radius of the given circle. Well, if 2 pi is the distance all the way around, 1 pi would be the distance halfway around. And pi over 2 would be only a quarter of that. And so if we're counting by pi over 2s, we've got 1 pi over 2, 2 pi's over 2, 3 pi's over 2 at the bottom, and 4 pi's over 2, which reduced to 2 pi. Now, I guess you could also say 0 is a coterminal angle with this measurement on the right. From there, we can divide this up much the same way we did before. We're going to divide the pi over 2 into thirds. And this almost makes a clock. When I draw this, I often think about a clock, where you've got 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. And granted, that counts the wrong direction, because we always count counterclockwise. But that'll give you all the spokes as we divide by 3. And so just kind of thinking off to the side here, if pi over 2 is that first quarter, and we divide it by 3 or find 1 third, each one of those spokes represents pi over 6. So each spoke is 1 pi over 6. So the next spoke then would be two of them, 2 pi over 6, which is going to reduce to pi over 3. The top is 3 pi over 6, which already reduces to pi over 2. The next one is 4 pi over 6, 5 pi over 6. We'll come back and reduce in a minute. 6 pi over 6 is the same as pi. Then there's 7 pi over 6, 8 pi over 6, 9 pi over 6 becomes the bottom, 10 pi over 6, 11 pi over 6, and 12 pi over 6 is the 2 pi. Now, you should notice that all the evens are going to reduce. So the evens we're going to call pi over 3, 4 pi over 3, and 5 pi over 3. And that's just reducing those fractions. So we'll never actually say 8 pi over 6. We'll say 4 pi over 3. We'll always use the reduced version. Similar to what we did before with the degrees, though, we're also interested in cutting right down the middle with an extra angle. And so with cutting in half, we originally had pi over 2. And we cut each of those in half this time. 
that's going to give us pi over 4. So we've got a pi over 4, 2 pi over 4 on the top, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4 on the left, which reduces to pi, and then 5 pi over 4, 6 pi over 4, which reduces to 3 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4, and finally the 8 pi over 4 becomes the right. This circle with angles measured in terms of the radius or in radians, you should be able to draw this circle very, very quickly. The sooner you memorize each of these key angles or are able to derive them quickly, the better off you will be. I always just remember that we're counting by pi over 6 or pi over 4 and count my way around the circle. So I didn't actually memorize it. I just count my way around. Some people prefer to memorize them all. Either way, we're going to use this circle a lot in this course. And the sooner you memorize it, the better off you will be. Now we're going to take much the same direction that we took before with degrees, this time just talking about radians. We're going to talk about coterminal angles again. We're going to take that same pi over 6 angle. Remember, that was the same as the 30 degree angle and do much the same thing with it. Instead of just going open to pi over 6, we're going to open all the way around to get a coterminal angle. Well, we were discussing that the distance around the circle is 2 pi with an extra pi over 6. So this is really saying pi over 6 plus 2 pi, which gets us around the circle. When I get a common denominator, 2 pi is 12 pi's, which means we've got 13 pi's over 6 as a coterminal angle. But again, we also have the option to go backwards. So if I go backwards, that's a negative angle. Again, we're looking at a pi over 6 angle, but this time we backed up the 2 pi. And so we subtract the 2 pi, or 12 pi over 6. 1 minus 12 is negative 11 pi over 6, gives us a coterminal angle. And so just like with degrees, we could add or subtract 360 degrees. We're now going to add or subtract one rotation of the circle, which is 2 pi radians. So let's do a couple examples of that. Let's start with an angle that's 15 pi over 4. Now, to get a coterminal angle, we need to subtract 2 pi. But to make this easier, let's keep the common denominator. So to get a common denominator of 4, we want to subtract 2 pi. 2 pi times 4 is 8 pi. And 15 minus 8 leaves us with 7 pi over 4 is our coterminal angle. And we should be able to count out 7 pi over 4. Remember, 4 are the quarters. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There is the angle at 7 pi over 4, which is coterminal with 15 pi over 4. Let's try one more. Let's do negative 13 pi over 6. Well, again, we're going to adjust by 2 pi. Since we're negative, we're going to add 2 pi. But we want to have a common denominator of 6. So 2 times 6, we're adding 12 pi, which gives us negative pi over 6. Well, we're going to add another 12 pi. I'm going to change directions because I'm running out of room on the screen. Add another 12 pi over 6. Add another rotation, and we end up with a positive 11 pi over 6. And that can help us see where this angle actually is. When we're counting by sixth, those are the clock digits. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 pi over 6, which is coterminal with negative pi over 6. And you can almost see that negative angle going backwards and coterminal with the negative 13 pi over 6 that we were working with. We can also work with arc length 
in radians. So let's take a quick look at arc length. Before, what we said with our arc length formula is we would do theta divided by the 360 degrees. Well, now all the way around the circle is 2 pi is equal to the arc length over the circumference, which is 2 pi times the radius. But what's nice about this formula is we can multiply both sides by 2 pi, because it's on both sides. And we get a better formula for arc length. Another reason why radians are better, it's the arc length divided by the radius. So if I have a radius of 5 feet and an angle of 5 pi over 6. Visually, what we're looking at, when we're dividing by 6, we're counting the spokes of the clock. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 pi over 6. That's over here. And the radius is 5 feet. We want to know how long is that arc length. Using our formula, we have theta, our angle is 5 pi over 6, is equal to the arc length that we look for divided by the radius, which is the 5 feet. So we just have to multiply both sides by 5. And the arc length is equal to 25 pi over 6 feet. And now we have the arc length of the piece we're looking for. So we've got a way to measure arc length, and we've got a way to measure angles, both in degrees and in radians. It kind of begs the question, though, if it's two ways to measure the same thing, is there a way to, we'll call this letter C, convert between radians and degrees? Well, the answer is yes, we can convert. And again, we're going to use a proportion. The easiest way to think about this proportion is we're just going to do half of the circle. In half of the circle, and because I can't use theta now, because theta talks about both degrees and radians. So I'm going to use r for radians and d for degrees. If we take the radians and divide by half the circle in radians, that's pi. If we take the degrees and divide by half the circle, that's 180. Those should both be equal to each other. That's our proportion. So if I've got 7 pi over 9 radians that I want to convert to degrees, we take our radians, which is 7 pi over 9 divided by half the circle, which is pi, is equal to degrees divided by half the circle, which is 180 degrees. What's nice here is the pi's can divide out. So we really have 7 ninths equals the degrees over 180. And we can solve for the degrees by multiplying both sides by 180. And 180 times 7 divided by 9 is going to be 140 degrees. So 7 pi over 9 is the same as 140 degrees. Let's do one where we go the other way. Let's take 240 degrees and convert it to radians. Again, we'll take the radians, which we don't know divided by pi is equal to the degrees 240 divided by half the circle, which is 180. Well, we just can start. If I start reducing here, I can divide 10 off really quick. And then I could even divide top and bottom by 6. And that leaves me with 4 thirds. So r over pi is equal to 4 thirds. To get the radians, we just multiply both sides by pi. And the radians are 4 pi over 3. 
and we've converted between the radians and the degrees. So there's three formulas and two circles that we covered today that you need to know. The first is converting radians and degrees. That's a proportion. The second you should know is finding arc length in radians. The third you should know is finding arc length in degrees. And if you think about where they come from, your proportion should set up quite easily from those. The two circles you should know then are the circle in degrees. That's going to be very important. But more important probably is this new one, the circle in radians. This circle we are going to use constantly throughout the entire course. You should be able to at least be able to build it, if not have it memorized as the course moves forward. So take a look at some of the homework assignments. Practice some of those. Let me know if you have any questions. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. The root of trigonometry is the same root as triangle. Triangles and trigonometry go hand in hand. So today we're going to answer the question, how are the ratios of the sides of triangles? related. And we're going to set up this conversation about the ratio of sides with a look at a familiar concept of slope. If I were to take a grid here, and we'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and one, two, three, four going up the side. And I'm going to draw a triangle that rises one and runs two from the origin. Rises one, runs two. We would say that the slope of that triangle is rise one, run two of one half. Now I can continue on with this line, rising another one and running another two to give me a bigger triangle. Now it rises 2 and runs a total of 4. And so if I were to calculate the slope of this green triangle, I would say it rises 2, runs 4, which reduces down to 1 half. I could again rise another run and run another 2, and gives me a bigger triangle that this time rises 3 and runs now a total of 6. And so if I wanted the slope of this bigger triangle, I would say it rises 3 and one, runs 6, which reduces down to 1 half. And you can start to see the pattern. You can see if I rise another 1 and run another 2, it'll be a rise of 4 and a run total of 8. And so if I'm calculating the slope, it comes out to be a rise of 4, run of 8, which also reduces to 1 half. And what's really important here is I want to note for all of these triangles, the angle on the left, which I'm going to call theta, that angle is exactly the same angle as the triangle gets bigger and bigger. And as long as I keep that same angle going up, my slope is always going to be exactly the same. The slope is always going to be 1 half. That's the idea of the ratio of sides that we're looking at today, is we're going to see if, regardless of the size of the triangle, if that angle stays the same, the ratio will also always stay the same. So to set this up, let's just state that if the angle remains constant, so does the ratio of the sides. So for example, if I were to draw a triangle here and keep this angle, we'll call it theta the same, 
the ratio of the sides will be exactly the same regardless of how big the triangle is as long as that angle doesn't change. Let's give each of these sides a name so we know what we're talking about. If I go across the triangle, we're going to call that the opposite side because it's opposite from the angle. The side right next to the angle, between the angle that we're talking about and the right angle, we're going to call the adjacent side. The one across from the right angle, we're going to call that the hypotenuse. There are three ratios of sides that we're going to talk about. The third one we've already talked about, actually. The third one is called the tangent of the angle theta. The tangent is the slope. It is the rise over the run. And in this triangle, it rises with the opposite side over the run, which is the adjacent side. So that tangent is always the same. It's opposite over adjacent. The other two that we talk about a lot are the sine of the angle and the cosine of the angle. The sine is calculated by taking the opposite side and dividing by the hypotenuse. The cosine is found by taking the adjacent side and dividing by the hypotenuse. And we need to know each of these three ratios really quick off the top of our head without much thinking. So you need to memorize these three ratios. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And tangent is opposite over the adjacent. And to kind of help remember, some people like this uh, rhyme of so ka toa. And that can help you remember the order. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. However you remember it is up to you. But you need to know each of those ratios so that you can solve triangles. And that's what we're going to do now. Solving right triangles. If I have this triangle here, and it's not drawn to scale, but let's say this angle is 20 degrees. We'll start with degrees. And let's say the side below it is 5. We want to solve for all the missing parts of this triangle, which means we need to know what the missing angle is. We need to know what this side over here on the left is. And we need to know what the side over here on the right is. Solving the triangle means finding all the missing angles and all the missing sides. To do that, we're first going to identify that the angle we know is 20 degrees. And the 5 is right next to it. The 5 is the adjacent side. The x is across from it. That's the opposite side. And the y is opposite the right angle. That's the hypotenuse side. So if we want to find the opposite side, the x, we know the adjacent. We're looking for the opposite. So I think which of my trig ratios uses adjacent and opposite? The tangent is the one that uses the adjacent and the opposite. So I take the tangent of my angle, which is 20 degrees, and that's going to equal to tangent is opposite over the adjacent, x over 5. And I can solve this equation by multiplying both sides by 5. And x is equal to 5 times the tangent of a 20 degree angle. Pulling out my calculator, then I can use my calculator to find what the tangent of 20 is. One thing you'll want to check is first click the Mode button. And you will notice one of the lines lets you choose between radians and degrees. It's very important you have the correct one marked. We talked about 20 degree angles, so I need to make sure my degrees is highlighted. Hit Enter. And then when I hit Second Quit, it'll take me back home. But now the calculator will work in degrees. So I can type in 5. The tangent button is right above the parentheses in the 9. 20 degree angle. Close the parentheses. And when I hit Enter, I find out that missing side x is 1.8. Let's round it to 2. So x is equal to 1.82. 1.82. We found the x. 
to find the y, y is the hypotenuse. And I always like to go back to the side that was given to us, the adjacent side. So I think about my SOHCAHTOA and which one uses adjacent and hypotenuse. Adjacent and hypotenuse is the cosine. So the cosine of my angle, the cosine of 20 degrees, is the adjacent, 5, divided by the hypotenuse, which is y. And then I just need to solve this equation for the y. First, I'll get rid of the fraction by multiplying both sides by y. And I have y cosine 20 equals 5. And if I divide both sides by the cosine of 20, y is 5 divided by the cosine of 20. So I can go back to my calculator, which we already set to degree mode, 5 divided by the cosine of 20. Close the parentheses, and I find out my y distance is 5.32. So the y distance is 5.32. The only piece left to find then on this triangle is the angle. And what's nice is we know from our geometry days that all the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. We also have a 90 degree angle in this triangle that I can subtract off. And we're told there's a 20 degree angle. So if I subtract that off, theta, the missing angle, is equal to 70 degrees. And so now I've solved this triangle. I know all the sides and all the angles. The missing angle was 70, the missing hypotenuse 5.32, and the missing side the opposite side, 1.82. Let's solve another triangle. Let's take this triangle, again, not drawn to scale. And let's say we know the sides are 4 and 5. And we don't know any of the angles or the opposite side. So there's a missing side over here. I'll call it x. But there's also two missing angles this time. I'm just going to call the angles alpha and beta, two more Greek letters. Remember, Greek letters will generally represent angles. So alpha and beta are the two missing angles we're looking for. And we don't really know either of the angles right now. So let's first see if we can figure out what the alpha angle is do this color coded. So alpha is in green. If I'm talking about the alpha angle, the 5 is across from it. So 5 is the opposite side. 4 is the adjacent side between the angle and the right angle. And so I think which trig ratio uses opposite and adjacent? Well, that would be the tangent. The tangent of our angle is equal to the opposite 5 divided by the adjacent 4. We do have a way to solve for that angle alpha that's inside the tangent. We have to undo tangent. And what we'll call the undo tangent is the tangent inverse, which uses a little negative 1, like inverse functions from pre-calc 1. And we take the tangent inverse of the 5 fourths, and that will equal the angle alpha. And fortunately, our calculator has a tangent inverse button. First, we hit the second. And then we hit the tangent button, will give us tangent inverse. And we just have to type in the 5 fourths and hit Enter. And it tells us that angle alpha is 51.3 degrees. So that is our angle alpha, 51.3 degrees. We can now find beta pretty quick if we wanted to, because we know that there's 180 degrees in a triangle minus the 90 degrees in the right angle, minus the 51.3 that we just found gives us the remaining angle, which is going to be beta, in this case, 38.7 degrees. So beta is 38.7 degrees. We're still missing, however, the x, the hypotenuse side. To get that, we're going to use another one of our formulas from our geometry days. In geometry, we know the Pythagorean theorem is that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. 
where C is the hypotenuse side. That's the side we're looking for. A will be 4 squared plus B is 5 squared equals C, which is x squared. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is 25. Add them together, and we get 41 is equal to the hypotenuse squared. And I can take the square root of both sides on my calculator. The square root of 41 is 6.40. So that tells us then the hypotenuse side is 6.40. And we solve the triangle for all the missing sides and all the missing angles. Let's do one more that might be a little bit more involved, though. Let's say we've got this triangle and then a smaller triangle inside of it. We've got a 60 degree angle, a 30 degree angle. The height is 50. And what we're going to attempt to find is x, which is just the distance between the two angles. Well, we got a right angle there. To do this, we're going to break it up into two triangles. First, looking at the smaller triangle, I'm going to call this other distance y. And from the 60 degree angle, the 50 is the opposite side, and the y is the adjacent side. I know that tangent of my angle 60 is equal to the opposite 50 over the adjacent y. Solving, I'll multiply both sides by y to get rid of the fraction. y tangent of 60 is equal to 50. Divide both sides by the tangent of 60. And when we put that in our calculator, 50 divided by the tangent of 60, we find out that y distance is 28 point. Let's round that to 9. So y is 28.9. Now that we've solved that smaller triangle, I'm going to look at the bigger triangle, which doesn't just have the x distance. It also has that 28.9 added to it. But we can use the same idea that if I take the tangent of the 30 degree angle now, because I'm looking at the big triangle now. It's going to be the opposite, which is 50, divided by the adjacent, which is the entire length, not just the x, but the x plus 28.9. But this gives me an equation that we do know how to solve. We'll multiply both sides by x plus 28.9, x plus 28.9. And I'm going to go ahead and distribute the tangent through. So I have x tangent of 30 plus 28.9 tangent of 30 equals 50. Getting everything without an x out of the way, I'm going to subtract that 28.9 tangent of 30 from both sides. And then finally, divide both sides by the tangent of 30. And x, the piece I'm looking for, is 50 minus 28.9 tangent of 30 divided by the tangent of 30. Now, when I put this in my calculator, I have to be very careful. For one, every time I hit the tangent button, it's going to open a parentheses. I need to make sure I close the parentheses. In addition, because there's multiple things going on in the numerator, we're going to have to put parentheses around the numerator so they're all grouped together. So we've got parentheses 50 minus 28.9 tangent of 30. Close the parentheses on the tangent. Close the parentheses on the numerator. Divided by the tangent of 30. Close the parentheses on the tangent. And when I hit Enter, we find out that that missing side x that we're looking for is 57.7.
we now have the length between the two angles is 57.7. And that's how we can solve triangles. Why are we so interested in solving right triangles? Well, the truth is there's lots of applications where we can use right triangles to find information that we want. First, to set this up, though, a little bit of vocabulary that you see often in application problems. One of them is the angle of elevation. That is the angle up from horizontal. Sometimes you'll hear the angle up from the horizon. So if the horizon is here, the angle of elevation, theta, is the angle up from that. That is the angle of elevation. We also have the angle of depression, that means the angle down from horizontal. So if I've got horizontal here, the angle of depression would be the theta, the angle down from the horizontal. Okay. So with that vocabulary in mind, Let's say we have a 150-foot tall monument is viewed from a window. The angle of elevation to the top is 5 degrees. The angle of depression to the bottom is 10 degrees. How far away is the window? So the idea is you're in a building. Here's the window. And you're looking out the window at some monument. There's the beautiful monument. And from the window, you are looking up to the top of the monument. The angle of elevation there, that's the angle with the horizontal, is 5 degrees. And you're also looking down to the bottom of the monument. Again, this is not to scale. That angle is 10 degrees. What we end up with, then, is two right triangles, where the total height is 150 feet. It's a 150-foot tall monument. We want to know x, how far away we are. Well, let's split this 150 feet tall between these two pieces of height. So we'll name one of the pieces y. Let's name the top one y, actually. My monument disappeared. We'll name the top one y. The bottom one is what's left. So we have 150 originally, and we'll subtract off the y that's left. Notice from our angles that we're talking about, in both cases, we are looking for the adjacent side, which is x. And we have at least an expression about the opposite side. So we're really working with a tangent in both cases. Tangent has opposite and adjacent. So if I took the tangent of the 5 degree angle, that would be the opposite y over x. Or I could take the tangent of the 10 degree angle. That would be the opposite 150 minus y over x. 
Let's solve this first equation for y. If I multiply both sides by x, we get x tangent of 5 equals y, which means wherever I see a y, I could replace it with x tangent of 5. I'm going to do that in the other equation. So I now know that the tangent of 10 is equal to 150 minus x tangent of 5 divided by x. And if you remember back in our pre-calculus 1 class, we solved lots of linear equations for x. First, clearing the fraction, I can multiply both sides by x. So x tangent of 10 equals 150 minus x tangent of 5, because the x's divide out. We'll move everything with an x to the other side by adding the x tangent of 5 to both sides equals 150. Now we can factor out the x, leaving behind the tangent of 10 plus the tangent of 5 is equal to 150. And we finally solve for x by dividing x is equal to 150 divided by the tangent of 10 plus the tangent of 5. Remember, x is that distance we were away from the monument in our window. That's that distance we're trying to find. As I type this in my calculator, I'm going to be careful because every time I hit tangent, it'll open a parentheses. I need to remember to close both those parentheses. In addition, because there's lots of stuff going on in the denominator, we need to make sure that denominator is in parentheses. So on my calculator, we have 150 divided by open up parentheses for the denominator, tangent of 10, close the parentheses on tangent, plus the tangent of 5, close the parentheses on tangent, close the parentheses on the denominator, and we find out that that distance from the monument is 568 point, let's call it 6 feet. So today, we're solving right triangles. You're using one of these three ratios, sine, cosine, and tangent, to find missing pieces. And your calculator will be helpful. Just make sure it's in degree mode as you're calculating those. So good luck on the homework assignment. Let me know if you have any questions. As we work to solve our right triangles for missing sides and missing angles, we had this caveat that it had to be a right triangle. Well, that begs the question, how do we solve other triangles? Triangles that have no right angle in them. Well, the answer to that question is a two-part answer. We're going to cover part one of that answer in this video and part two in the next video. So first, some theory behind what we're doing. Let's say I have some triangle. It's not a right triangle. And let's give it two angles. Let's say this is angle alpha and angle beta. Again, Greek letters to represent angles. And we're going to label the opposite side from alpha the letter A, and the opposite side from beta the letter B. We're also going to drop the height down on this triangle, because when we drop the height, that will create two right triangles. We have um, the right triangle on the left and the right triangle on the right. And notice from that, from alpha and beta, the height is always the opposite side. And the A and the B are always the hypotenuse side. We don't know anything about the adjacents to alpha and beta. If I were to take then the sine of the alpha angle, that would be equal to the opposite, or the height, over the hypotenuse, which is b. And if I were to take the sine of the other angle, the sine of beta, that would be equal to the opposite h over the hypotenuse side, which in this case would be the a. 
We can solve both of these equations for the height by multiplying by the denominators. So the first one would be b times the sine of alpha is equal to the height. And the second one would be a times the sine of the beta is equal to the height. And since they're both equal to the height, they must both be equal to each other. So the first one is b sine of alpha must be equal to the other one, which is a sine of beta. To make this formula, though, easier to use, we're going to divide both sides by the side lengths. We're going to divide by AB on both sides. And when we do that, we can reduce out the A's and the B's. And what that leaves us with is that the sine of alpha divided by the opposite side A is equal to the sine of beta divided by the opposite side b. And similarly, we can extend this and say, also, if the other angle was gamma, the sine of gamma, another Greek letter, over its opposite side, which would be c. This formula is what we call the law of sines. And that is the sine of any angle divided by the opposite side is equal to the sine of any other angle divided by the opposite side. So this is the big formula that you need to know for today's video. And so if that's the law of sines, let's see if we can use it to help us solve triangles that are not right triangles. So here's another triangle not drawn to scale. We're going to say the top angle is 80 degrees, the left angle is 40 degrees, and the bottom side is 15. Notice if I go in order, we've got an angle, an angle, and a side. We call that angle, angle, side. We should be able to solve this triangle for all the missing pieces. We've got a missing uh, side on the left. We've got a missing side on the right. And we also have a missing angle, which I'll just call theta. As we solve, the important thing we note is that we know an angle and its opposite side. So that tells us that the sine of that angle 80 divided by its opposite side 15 would be equal to the sine of another angle 40 divided by the opposite side, which is y. And now we can solve for the y, which is opposite the 40. Solving for the y, we multiply both sides by y to get it out of the fraction. So we have the sine of 80 over 15 equals the sine of 40. And then to get y by itself, we can multiply the sine of 40 by the reciprocal 15 over the sine of 80. Again, when we type this in our calculator, we'll be careful to put parentheses around the sign. And because there's a lot of stuff happening in the numerator and the denominator, we'll put parentheses around the numerator. So if we open a parentheses for the numerator and take the sign of 40, close the parentheses on the sign, times 15, close the parentheses on the numerator, divided by the sign of 80, close the parentheses on the sign, and hit Enter, we find out our first missing side y is 9.79. So 9.79 for that missing side. We can find x in much the same way, but first we need to know what its opposite angle is. And that's found easy enough. 
theta, the angle, is always equal to 180 minus the other two angles, minus 80 minus 40. And so theta, the angle over there, is equal to a 60 degree angle. So using the law of sines then, we'll still use the pieces that we knew, starting with the sine of 80 divided by 15. And then we'll go to the pieces we don't know, the sine of 60 over x. The sine of 60 over x. And we're going to solve it in much the same way, multiplying both sides by x, leaving behind the sine of 60, and then getting the x alone by multiplying the sine of 60 by the reciprocal times 50 over the sine of 80 making sure I remember every time I hit sign, it'll open a parentheses. I need to remember to close it and close the parentheses around the entire thing. And when you put that in the calculator in much the same way, you'll find out that the missing side is 13.19. So for missing sides, 13.19. We've now solved for the two missing sides and the missing angle of our triangle. Let's try another example. We'll call that example one. Let's do now example two. Let's say we have a triangle, again, not to scale, where the top angle is 70 degrees, the left side is 9, and the bottom is 10. Notice this one, if I go in order, we've got an angle, a side, and a side. We'll call that angle side side. And these problems become somewhat annoying. If we end up with an ASS, and you can spell that and figure out why it's a pain in the butt, are a little tricky. Whenever we have an ASS relationship, let's go ahead and write this ASS, sometimes that means we could have 0. Sometimes it could mean we have 1. And sometimes it could mean we have two options for our triangle, which means we're going to have to take 180 minus the angles for the second option. Here's what I mean by that. The first thing I see is we've got 70 directly across from the 10. So that's going to be my first setup, that the sine of 70 over 10 is equal to, let's say this first angle, we're going to call it alpha, is directly across from the 9. The alpha is the one that we could have 0, 1, or 2 options for. So we'll say that the sine of the alpha over 9. We'll start solving this equation. We can multiply both sides by 9. So we have 9 sine of 70 divided by 10 equals the sine of alpha. And we found out in our previous video that the opposite of a sine to undo sine is to do a sine inverse of the other side of 9 sine 70 over 10 equals alpha. So on our calculator, we'll hit second sine inverse of 9 times the sine of 70. Make sure you close the parentheses on the sine. Divided by 10, close the parentheses on the sine inverse. And it's going to tell me that alpha is equal to 57.7 degrees. That is one option. Or it could be equal to what's left over when we take 180 minus the angle of 57.7, which would be 122.3. So we have two options for alpha. The way we're going to decide which one is correct is we're going to look at the other angle, beta. Doing the other angle, beta, 
In the first case, we know all the angles are 180 minus the 70 that was given to us minus the 57.7. When we do it that way, we end up beta is equal to 52.2 degrees. So we've got one option here. Alpha is 57.7, beta 52.2. Or alpha could be 122 degrees. To find beta, beta we take the 180 degrees. We subtract the 70 that was given to us. And we'll also subtract the 122.3 degrees that we just found. In that case, beta is equal to negative 12.3. Well, we can't have a negative angle. So in this case, the second option did not come to fruition. If beta was positive, we'd actually be talking about two different triangles, and we'd have to solve for both of them. But in this case, since we got a negative, only one of them actually exists. So we now know that alpha must be 57.7. Beta, the other angle, is 52.2. We now can solve for the only missing piece, side B, which is opposite the 52.2 angle. So we set up that our sine of 70 over 10 is equal to the sine of 52.2 over the opposite side of B. And we can solve it in much the same way. Multiply both sides by B gives us b sine 70 over 10 is the sine of 52.2. Multiplying by the reciprocal, we get the sine of 52.2 times 10 divided by the sine of 70. And then our calculator will do all the rest of the work for us. The sine of 52.2, close the parentheses on the sine, times 10 divided by the sine of 70 close the parentheses on the sign. And b, our other side, is 8.41. And we have now solved for the missing side and angle of this triangle. So again, the one thing you have to be careful of is as you go around, do you have an angle side side? If you have an angle side side, you might have two possibilities. If you have any other combination of letters, there's only one possibility. But angle side side is one you have to watch out for. Before we wrap up, let's do one application. Let's say two people, 50 miles apart. have spotted a UFO between them in the distance. The first person had an angle of elevation of 20 degrees. The second had an angle of elevation of 25 degrees. We want to know how high is the UFO. So we have two people 50 miles apart. And this UFO flying above them that they're both looking up at. The first one had an angle of elevation of 20 degrees. The second one had an angle of elevation of 25 degrees. We want to know how high is that UFO. 
Now we might be tempted to use right triangle trig to get started because we do have right angles from that height. The problem is, is we don't have all the pieces we need. We don't know how that 50 is split up on the two sides. And we could use a system of equations with right triangles. But this is going to be much easier to solve using the law of sides. First, we're going to find this missing angle up top. That missing angle up top, we've got 180 degrees in the triangle, 20 degrees from the first person, 25 degrees from the second person. That missing angle is 135 degrees. In this case, as we go around the triangle, we've got, we have to use the 135. It's important because it's opposite the 50 that we know. We always need that opposite relationship to use the law of sines. We go either way around this triangle. I'm just going to go around the right. We've got an angle, an angle, and a side. Angle, angle, side. Nothing wrong with that combination. There's only one triangle possible. So we'll start setting up our law of sines. That the sine of 135 over 50 is equal to, let's use the 25 and its missing opposite side of x. the sine of 25 over x. Solving these, we should be really good at multiplying x on both sides. So it's out of the fraction. Then multiplying by the reciprocal. So we have the sine of 25 times 50 over the sine of 135. And again, really important to close the parentheses on the sine. And so when I pull up my calculator, the sine of 25, close the parentheses, times 50, divided by the sine of 135, close the parentheses, gives us 29.9. So we now know that x side is 29.9. I'm going to scroll down to give us a little more room, because what that tells us is if I look at just this right triangle on the left side, if I copy that triangle down here, we know the hypotenuse is 29.9. We have an angle of 20 degrees. And ultimately, what we're solving for is the height. Well, this is just opposite over hypotenuse. This is a regular sine of 20 equals h over 29.9. Solving by multiplying both sides by 29.9, sine of 20 is equal to the height. 29.9 times the sine of 20, close the parentheses on the sine, and the height is about 10.2 miles. So 10 miles high is this UFO. All right, now it's your turn to practice with the law of sines, that the sine of any angle over its opposite side is equal to the sine of any other angle over its opposite side. Be careful of the angle side side option, where there might be 0, 1, or 2 possibilities. Otherwise, there's going to be only one possibility. Take a look at the homework, practice a few of these, and let me know if you have any questions. As we work to solve triangles that are not right triangles for their missing sides and angles, I mentioned it was a two-part answer to how do we solve these triangles. With the law of sines, what was required for us to have at some point was an angle and its opposite side known to us. So the question then to answer part two of that question is, what happens? What if we don't know? a side and its opposite angle. Can we still solve this triangle? Well, let's look at the theory behind what we have. Again, very similar to last time. We're going to start off with a triangle. And to do this, I'm going to start with calling this left side angle gamma. 
Across from gamma is going to be side C, because C is the third letter of the alphabet, and gamma is the third letter of the Greek alphabet. The right side I'm going to call beta. Opposite it is going to be B. And the top angle I'm going to call alpha. And the side opposite it I'm going to call A. And very similar to last time, we're going to drop a height down of this triangle. And this time, we're going to break A up into two pieces, the left side and the right side. And let's call the left side just x. We don't really know what that is. The right side then is going to be the entire distance A minus x. And what I'm going to do then is we're going to focus for a minute on angle gamma. And the cosine of that angle gamma. Now, cosine is going to look at the right triangle. So the smaller right triangle on the left is going to be equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse x over b. And if I multiply both sides by b, we find out that x is equal to b times the cosine of our gamma. Okay. The other thing I'm going to look at is the Pythagorean theorem on both the left and right side. On the left side, the Pythagorean theorem is going to be x squared plus h squared equals b squared. On the right side, the Pythagorean theorem is going to be h squared plus whatever this a minus x is squared is equal to c squared. And like we did before, we don't really like the h in there. So we're going to solve for the h parts. Getting h squared alone by subtracting x squared would be b squared minus x squared. On the right side, getting h squared alone would be c squared minus a minus x squared. And what's nice, if they're both equal to h squared, we know they must be both equal to each other. So b squared minus x squared is equal to c squared minus the a minus x squared. And then here's where we get to do a little bit of fun algebra to get an awesome result at the end. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply out the a minus x squared. Remember, there's a negative in front of it. So that's going to change the sign as it distributes through. So we have b squared minus x squared is equal to c squared minus a squared. Minus a minus is a positive. Remember, when we're squaring, we have that middle term of 2 times the product ax. And then when we square the x, it's x squared distributing the negative through. This is kind of neat because you notice they both have a minus x squared on both sides. If we add that x squared to both sides, we're going to be left with b squared equals c squared minus a squared plus 2ax. I'm going to move the last two terms over to the right side by adding the a squared. That'll give us a squared plus b squared. And subtracting the 2ax, which then is equal to c squared. It kind of looks like the Pythagorean theorem almost. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The difference is there's this minus 2ax. And what we're going to do is recall from back up a ways when I use the cosine that x is equal to b times the cosine of that gamma angle. So we're going to replace the x, and we will have a squared plus b squared minus 2a. The x gets replaced with b cosine of the gamma equals c squared. This is the law of cosines. And it is a formula that you should commit to memory. It is a formula that we can use to solve a non-right triangle when we don't have that opposite angle side relationship that allows us to use the law of sines. 
Now, whenever possible, I highly encourage you to use the law of sines. It's easier and quicker. However, sometimes we can't because we have the wrong sides. Let's look at some examples. Let's say we have this triangle where I know we've got a 40 degree angle. The right side is 9. The bottom side is 8. Notice we cannot say we've got an angle and its opposite side because we don't know what they are. What we do have is a side, an angle, and a side. That's side, angle, side which is one of the times when we can use the law of cosines. To make that work, our angle is going to be the gamma, and the opposite side is going to be the C. The 9 and the 8 in any order can be A and B. And then we just plug into our formula for the law of cosines. Law of cosines says A squared, so 9 squared, plus B squared, which is 8 squared, minus 2 times a, which is 9, times b, which is 8, times the cosine of the angle, which is 40, equals c squared. And what's nice about this situation is I can just type that entire thing in my calculator exactly like it is. 9 squared plus 8 squared minus 2 times 9 times 8 times the cosine of 40. And when I hit Enter, we end up with 34 point, I'm going to call it 7, equals c squared. So c is the square root of that. And on the calculator, we can just do second square root. And second, click the negative sign to get the square root of the previous answer, which is about 5 point, we'll call it 9. That missing side then is 5.9. We still need to find the missing angles. So let's say alpha is opposite the A. And what's nice now is I now know an angle and its opposite side. So now we can use the law of sines to say that the sine of 40 over the 5.9 that we just found is equal to the sine of our alpha over the 9. Normally, when we have a sine of alpha, we have to be careful of the two triangle case. But that's only if we start off with the uh, angle side side situation. We started off with a side angle side situation here. So we should be locked into only one triangle that actually works here. So when we multiply both sides by 9, we get 9 sine of 40 divided by 5.9 equals the sine of alpha. And then we can do the sine inverse of the 9 sine 40 over 5.9 is equal to our alpha. Again, being careful, when we hit the sign, it's going to open a parentheses. Make sure we close it. So we have the sine inverse of 9 times the sine of 40, close the parentheses on the sine, divided by 5.9, close the parentheses on the sine inverse. And we end up with 78.7. 78.7 is equal to our alpha. So to find our last piece, there's 180 degrees in the triangle, minus the 40 that was given to us, minus the 78.7 that we just found. And we end up with our last angle, we'll call it beta, is equal to 61.3 degrees. And we've now solved that triangle. Let's try solving one more that uses the law of cosines. But this time, rather than giving us the side angle side, We're going to do a triangle where we know all three sides, 5, 6, and 7. And we're going to find the angles alpha, beta, and gamma. 
How do we decide which one to go after first? Well, the best strategy to do to guarantee that you get the right triangle, hint, find the largest angle first. with the law of cosines. And if you find the largest angle first, you're guaranteed to get the right uh, triangle without having to worry about that ambiguous case where there could be two. So the largest angle, we'll call that gamma, is always across from the largest side, which we call C. Similar to the Pythagorean theorem, c squared is always the biggest one. So the other two can be a and b in either order. And when we set up our law of cosines, it's a squared, or 5 squared, plus b squared, 6 squared, minus 2 times a times b, 5 times 6, times the cosine of the angle, which is gamma, is equal to c squared. Now, when we're solving for the angle, we can't just plug it into our calculator. We have to do a little bit of algebra first. So let's go ahead and simplify a few things. 5 squared is 25. 6 squared is 36. 2 times 5 times 6 is 60. Cosine of gamma equals 49. The 60 is attached to the cosine. It cannot be combined with the other numbers. So I'm going to subtract 25 and subtract 36 from both sides. And when I do, we get negative 60 cosine of gamma is equal to 49 minus 25 minus 36 is negative 12. And then dividing both sides by 60, um, let's just leave it as negative divided by negative is a positive. I'm just going to leave it as 12 sixtieths, just to make sure I don't get any round off error, just in case. We know if the cosine is equal to that fraction, the cosine inverse of the fraction, 12 over 60, is going to equal the angle we're looking for, which is gamma. So again, our calculator. We'll do cosine inverse of 12 over 60. And gamma, that angle is 78 point, we'll call it 5 degrees. Now that we've got one angle with the law of cosines, we should be able to find another angle with the law of sines. And it doesn't matter which one we go after. So let's go after A or alpha. Alpha is going to be across from the A, which is 5. Gamma is across from C, which is 7. So our law of sines says the sine of 78.5 over 7 is equal to the sine of alpha over 5. And we should be very comfortable solving these, multiplying both sides by 5 to get the sine of 78.5 over 7 equals the sine of alpha. And then we can take the sine inverse of all of that. 5 sine 78.5 over 7 is going to equal our alpha. On the calculator, sine inverse of 5 times the sine of 78.5, close the parentheses, divided by 7, close the parentheses. And we find out that alpha is 44.4 .4 degrees. So 44.4 .4 degrees in the triangle. The only one left to find is beta. Each angle or each piece is always easier to find than the previous. We know a triangle has 180 degrees. Subtract the 78.5 that we found. Subtract the 44.4 that we found. Beta is equal to what's left, 57.1 degrees. And we solved our triangle all started by the law of cosines. 
So another formula to keep track of, law of cosines, we use it whenever we don't have a side and its opposite angle. If we do have a side and opposite angle, we'll use the law of sines, which is much nicer and quicker. But if not, the law of cosines will always get us there. It's time for you to try a few of these, practice them, and let me know if you have any questions. This video is probably the most important video of your study of trigonometry because we're going to talk about the points on a circle that make up the foundation for everything you're going to see from here moving forward. We're going to bring together the concepts of right triangle trig and angles on a circle together to find points on a circle. That's really our question. How do we find points? on a circle. And we're going to start with the theory behind what we're going to see on this thing called the unit circle, or a circle with a radius equal to 1. The theory behind it is really important. The better you understand the theory behind the unit circle, the easier it is to learn the unit circle. And so for our first example, we're going to start with a right triangle. And this right triangle is going to be a 45, 45, 90 right triangle. And we're going to say the hypotenuse has a distance of 1. And we don't know what the other two sides are. But what's nice about a 45, 45, 90 right triangle is it guarantees those other sides are exactly the same. So we know from the Pythagorean theorem then, using this triangle, a squared plus a squared equals 1 squared. Or if we combine like terms, 2a squared equals 1. Divide by 2, a squared is 1 half. And take the square root of both sides. The square root of 1 is 1, and the square root of 2 is the square root of 2. Now we like to rationalize our denominators. So we'll multiply by root 2 over root 2. And so we get the square root of 2 over the square root of 2. And so this is going to provide one of three important triangles for us that we're going to use is if ever we have a 45 degree angle, which if you remember is also equal to pi over 4 radians. And if the hypotenuse is 1, the other two lengths, the length to the left and right is root 2 over 2, and the length up and down is root 2 over 2. That is our first important triangle, if you can remember that. The second important triangle is part of an equilateral triangle. If I have an equilateral triangle, all the sides are the same length, and all the angles are the same. So if I take my angles, 180 divided by 3, each angle is 60 degrees. And each side is the same length as well. So let's say the sides are of length 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a height down that divides the top angle in half to a 30 and a 30. And it also divides the length of the bottom into 1 half and 1 half, which gives you the one whole. And if I just look at one of these right triangles, how about the one on the right, what we see is the Pythagorean theorem becomes, let's call the height b, 1 half squared plus b squared equals 1 squared which gives us 1 fourth plus b squared equals 1. Subtracting the 1 fourth from both sides, b squared equals 3 fourths. And taking the square root of both sides, b is the square root of 3 over the square root of 4 is 2. So what that tells us is for two more important triangles, which are going to be almost identical, the first one is going to have a sharp 30 degree angle, which we know is pi over 6 radians, and a hypotenuse of 1. The second is going to have a tall 60 degree angle, which is, we know is pi over 3. 
and again the hypotenuse is 1. These two triangles are very similar because the opposite angle from the 30 degree is the 60 degree angle, and the opposite from the 60 is the 30 degree angle. So it's really the same triangle tip different directions. What we need to remember about this triangle is the shorter distance is always 1 half, and the longer distance is always the square root of 3 over 2. If I think about it, you might notice that the shortest distance, if we have a short distance on a triangle, it's 1 half. If we have a medium distance, it's the square root of 2 over 2. And if we have a long distance, it's the square root of 3 over 2. So it's the square root of 1 over 2, the square root of 2 over 2, and the square root of 3 over 2 as the angles get bigger. What does this have to do with circles? Well, that's where number 3 comes in. I'm going to draw really large the first quadrant. And we're going to imagine a circle that comes through this first quadrant. The circle has a radius of 1. So this point off to the right has 1, 0 as a coordinate. The point up above has the coordinates of 0, 1. We know both the angles that go with these. The point on the right is a 0 degree or 0 radian angle. We also called it 360 degrees or 2 pi would be all the way around the circle. The top one, though, that's a 90 degree angle or pi over 2. But we're going to draw a few more angles onto here. The first angle that I want to draw is a 30 degree angle. And when I draw that 30 degree angle and drop down a right triangle, I know with the 30 degree angle, the long distance on the bottom is root 3 over 2, and the short distance going up is 1 half. That means the coordinates of that point are x, root 3 over 2, comma y, 1 half. And as we already said, that's a 30 degree angle, which is also the same as pi over 6. If I come to the middle, I'm going to erase the extra lines here. If I come to the middle, what we end up with is a 45 degree angle. And we know at the 45 degree angle, the two sides are the same. And they're in the middle, the square root of 2 over 2. So if I want the coordinates of that point, the coordinates of that point are root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2, because that's how far over and up we had to go. We already said that's a 45 degree angle. And you remember that's pi over 4 radians. I'm going to erase a couple extra lines this time as well, leaving behind the spoke. If I go up and make a 60 degree angle, we know with the 60 degree angle, same as the 30 degree angle, the short side is 1 half. The long side is root 3 over 2. So the coordinates of that point are over 1 half, up root 3 over 2. And that, after I delete my extra stuff here, is a 60 degree angle, which we know is pi over 3. We now have the coordinates of all the key points in the first quadrant that go with our key angles, both in degrees and radians, that we saw back in our first video. Now, what's nice is everything's symmetrical. So this can all be flipped over the x-axis and the y-axis. And the same logic can be used to build the entire unit circle. Now, some people like to memorize the entire unit circle. But I prefer the easier way, where if I know that I'm, for instance, at 5 pi over 3, I know the shorter distance is always 1 half. 
the longer distance is always root 3 over 2. But because it's down, I know that particular root 3 over 2 has to be negative, and that'll give us the coordinate point, 1 half negative root 3 over 2. One more example on here. If I could draw 5 pi over 4, 225 degrees, that one I know is right in the middle. Because it's right in the middle, I know it's root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. But because the x coordinate is backwards, the x is negative, and the y coordinate is down, the y is negative. And that's how we end up with the coordinate point of 5 pi over 4. And that's kind of how the entire circle gets filled in. Why do we care so much about all those key points on the circle? Well, it comes from an interesting relationship that we can notice about a triangle. Let's say we don't know the angle. We'll just call the angle theta. We already recognize from the coordinate plane the distance to the right is x, and the distance up is y. Look what happens when we calculate the cosine of theta. Cosine is the adjacent x over the hypotenuse, which we are dealing with a unit circle. So the hypotenuse is always 1 here, which means the cosine of theta is just equal to the x coordinate. Similarly, if we found the sine of theta, sine is the opposite y over the hypotenuse 1, which means the sine of theta is equal to the y coordinate. In other words, if I want the x or the y, I'm calculating the exact same thing as the cosine or the sine. Cosine is the x coordinate. Sine is the y coordinate. So if I'm asked to find a sine or a cosine, I just need to decide if I'm looking for the x coordinate or the y coordinate. So let's see if we can practice finding some of these points on the unit circle. Let's start off with finding the sine of pi over 3. Well, if I sketch a quick unit circle, pi over 3 is the same as 2 sixths. So we count 2 of a sixth, 1, 2 sixths, 2 sixths. Pi over 3 is right there. We know the short distance is 1 half. The long distance is root 3 over 2. In this case, they're both positive. So that's 1 half root 3 over 2. But sine is particularly interested in the y coordinate. So the sine of pi over 3, we now know, is the square root of 3 over 2. Let's try another example. Let's do the cosine of 240 degrees. Well, if I draw my unit circle, 240 degrees is a little less than 270, so it's down here. And I know the short distance is 1 half. The long distance is root 3 over 2. And because it's backwards, left would be a negative 1 half. Down is a negative root 3 over 2. That's the coordinates of the point. But I want the cosine, which is particularly interested in the x coordinate. The cosine of 240 degrees is negative 1 half. How about finding the sine of negative 3 pi over 4? 3 pi over 4 is counting quarters, but it's negative. So we're going to count backwards. 1. 2, 3 pi over 4. We're talking about the angle right there. This one divides the circle right on a quarter, so they're exactly the same length, root 2 over 2 and root 2 over 2. Again, we went backwards, so it's negative root 2 over 2, comma negative root 2 over 2. 
But with the sine, we're particularly interested in the y coordinate. So the sine of negative 3 pi over 4 is negative root 2 over 2. Let's do one more. Let's do the cosine of 21 pi over 6. Well, over 6 is when we split it up like the clock. So we can count around 1, 2, 3 at the top, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 at the bottom, 10, 11, 12 at the right. And then we're going to copy over it. 13, 14, 15 at the top, 16, 17, 18 at the left, 19, 20, 21. It's the line straight down. What's nice about straight down is we know the circle has a radius of 1. So the point we're talking about here is 0 to the left, 1 down, which is negative 1. We're looking for the cosine, which is the x coordinate. So the cosine is equal to. 0. Let's try a similar but slightly different question. Let's find the angle that has the same sign as pi over 3. Well, pi over 3 is 2 sixths, so that's 1, 2 pi over 3. We want the angle that has the same sine. Well, sine is the y coordinate. So if we make a horizontal line, we have the same height all the way across. And what you see is this angle over here to the left has the same y coordinate, the same height, which means the same sine as pi over 3. That's just another sixth over. So we count 1, 2, 3, 4 sixths, which reduces to 2 pi over 3. So 2 pi over 3 has the same sine value as 1 pi over 3. If I wanted to know what that is, I could drop either of these triangles to make my right angles. And I know the short sides are 1 half, and the long sides are root 3 over 2. And sine is the y coordinate. So the sine of both of these is the square root of 3 over 2. The cosine would have been different. The cosine would have been negative. Let's try another one, this time in degrees, very similar to that one. Let's find the angle that has the same cosine as 110 degrees. Now, you might recognize or fail to recognize 110 is not one of our common angles. 110 is a different angle that's between our common angles. But that's OK. We can still answer the question. We might not be able to figure out what the cosine is. But we do know 110 degrees is between 90 and 180. So the cosine is going to be over here somewhere. Not exactly there. It's not to scale. But we, for our purposes, we can say it's there. The cosine is the x coordinate. So we want the x coordinate to remain the same. So we'll go down to the x and keep going to get our new angle. Now we have to figure out how many degrees are in that angle. Well, we already know that we've got the 110 degree angle. How many more degrees would get to 180? Well, 70 more degrees would get to 180, which means that lower angle is also 70 degrees. So in red, it would be all three angles together. The 110, the 70, and the other 70, giving us 250 degrees. 250 degrees and 110 degrees are each going to have the same cosine. They're going to have the same x coordinate. We don't know what it is because it's not one of our common angles, but we definitely can decide that they both have the same 
cosine. And this example gives rise to a discussion about these things called reference angles. You notice both of those angles that we drew on the left had a 70 degree angle with the horizontal. Those reference angles are often helpful to us as we solve these trig problems. A reference angle is an angle that has the same, always positive, angle with the horizontal. So for example, um, let's do a 210 degree angle. We're going to find the reference angle. And just for practice, because 210 is a common angle, we're going to also find the sine and cosine. So if I draw my unit circle, 210 is just a little bit more than 180. In fact, how much more the angle with the horizontal, it's 30 degrees more. So the reference angle is 30 degrees. That's what we mean by reference angle, the angle with the horizontal, always positive. And that can really help us see, OK, the short side is 1 half. The long side is root 3 over 2. So the coordinates of that, because it's backwards and down, are negative root 3 over 2 comma negative 1 half, which tells us that the sine of 210, sine is the y coordinate, is negative 1 half. And it tells us the cosine of 210 degrees is negative root 3 over 2. So reference angles is really what we're looking at when we're deciding, is it a short side, is it a long side, or are the sides equal? Square root of 1, square root of 2, square root of 3, as the sides get bigger. Now, everything we've done up to this point has all been about the unit circle, where the circle has a radius of 1. But obviously, all circles don't have a radius of 1. So let's talk really briefly about what we can do when it's not a unit circle. And basically, we're just going to have to adjust our theory, when, which all started with looking at a triangle. On our triangle, we had x, y, and we called the hypotenuse 1. Everything we've done to this point assumed the hypothesis was 1. Well, now I'm going to say the hypotenuse is r. If I do that, the cosine of theta is now x over r. And if I multiply both sides by r, I find out r cosine theta is equal to x. Similarly, the sine of theta is equal to the y over r. And multiplying both sides by r tells me that the r sine of theta is equal to y. But another relationship that we haven't used a lot yet is the Pythagorean theorem that says x squared plus y squared equals r squared for this triangle. This is nice because x is equal to r cosine theta. So if I replace x with r squared cosine squared theta plus y, replace the y with r sine theta, squaring it gives us r squared sine squared theta is equal to r squared. Well, what's interesting about this is if we factor out an r squared, it gives us cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals r squared. And then divide both sides by r squared, 
it leaves behind cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. And actually, if we rewrite this, we'll get what we're going to often call our Pythagorean identity. I'm going to switch the order and just write it as sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1 is the way we normally see it. This is probably one of the most important relationships that comes out of trig. Regardless of what sine or cosine are, sine squared plus cosine squared will always equal 1. Let's look at some examples where we can use that property. Let's say if the sine of theta equals 2 thirds and theta is in quadrant 2, find the cosine of theta. I always start all mine with drawing a little picture. Remember, our quadrants start in the top right with 1, and they go counterclockwise numbering. So our theta is somewhere in quadrant 2. So it's over there somewhere. What's important to note about that point in quadrant 2 is the x is negative and the y is positive because it's left and up. And we also know that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So if sine is 2 thirds, we have 2 thirds squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Simplifying, squaring 2 thirds gives us 4 ninths plus cosine squared equals 1. Subtracting 4 ninths from both sides, 1 is 9 ninths, so 9 minus 4 is 5 ninths. And taking the square root of both sides, cosine of theta is equal to plus or minus the square root of 5 over root 9 is 3. Cosine is the x-coordinate. And we notice in this case, the x-coordinate is negative. So our actual answer for the cosine of theta must be the negative version, root 5 over 3. Let's try one more example. Let's say if cosine of theta is equal to 1 fifth, and theta is in quadrant 4, find the sine of theta. Again, I'll draw my picture. Theta is in quadrant 4, and so if we count clock counterclockwise around, it's somewhere down here in the bottom right. And what's important that we note there is while the x-coordinate is positive, the y-coordinate is negative to go over and down. From there, we know that sine squared plus cosine squared of theta is equal to 1. So we don't know what sine is, but we do know cosine is 1 fifth squared equals 1. And then we can solve for the sine. 1 fifth squared gives us 1 over 25 equals 1. Subtracting the 1 over 25 from both sides, 25 minus 1 is 24 over 25. And taking the square root of both sides will give us a plus or minus the square root of 24 over 5. And we can probably simplify that because 24 is 4 times 6. So that's 2 root 6 over 5, plus or minus. But again, we're talking about the sine. 
sign we know is the y coordinate. Here, the y coordinate has to be negative. So now we know that the sine of theta is the negative 2 root 6 over 5. All of this comes from knowing the unit circle, knowing your key angles and where they are, and knowing what the coordinates of those points are. Again, rather than taking the time to memorize all the points, I encourage you to keep track of, is it a short distance, a longer distance, or are both distance the same? So you can decide if it's the square root of 1 over 2, the square root of 2 over 2, or the square root of 3 over 2. Practice this on the homework. This unit circle is essential that we're comfortable and familiar with it as we move on with our study of trig. We've spent a lot of our time talking about the sine and cosine of the unit circle and of triangles. But there are other trig functions. There's actually six trig functions total. And while we use sine and cosine the most, we should be familiar with what other trig functions exist. And to set this up, let's start with our little circle, the unit circle that we've come to know and love. And we're going to draw a distance here. And for now, let's just call it r. Let's not make it a unit circle. And it has an x coordinate and a y coordinate. Its points are x comma y. And what we know is there are several trig functions. Each trig function has a ratio. And we're going to look at what happens to that ratio if the radius is equal to 1, if we have a unit circle. So we already know the sine of theta, given that the angle theta is in the center. The sine of theta is going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. So y over r. So if r is 1, the sine is just the y coordinate. We already know the cosine of theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse r. And if the radius is equal to 1 and we have a unit circle, the cosine is just equal to x. But we also have tangent that we've seen before. The tangent of theta is the opposite y over the adjacent x. And what's interesting is it doesn't matter what the radius is equal to. It could be a unit circle or not. It's going to still be y over x. What's also interesting there, and we're going to kind of refer to this more officially later in the course, if it's y over x, y is the sine of theta and x is the cosine of theta. So another way to think about tangent is to think about it as the sine over the cosine. But there are a, actually three other trig functions that we haven't worked with yet. These are the reciprocal. If I were to take 1 over the sine of theta, the reciprocal of the sine of theta we're going to call the cosecant of theta. And so it's just the opposite ratio of the sine. So sine was y over r. The cosecant is r over y, or on the unit circle, 1 over the y coordinate. So the reciprocal of sine is cosecant. We also have a reciprocal of cosine, 1 over the cosine of theta is what we call the secant of theta. Since it's the reciprocal of cosine, we'll take the cosine ratio and flip it upside down. It's r over x. Or if the radius is 1, it's 1 over x. We also have a reciprocal of tangent. The reciprocal of tangent we're going to call the cotangent of theta. And so we just flip the fraction for tangent over, and it becomes x over y, regardless if it's a unit circle or not. And similar to tangent, we said tangent is the same as sine over cosine. 
cotangents, the reciprocal cosine over the sine of theta. So we have all of these reciprocal functions and other functions that we can work with and do much of the same stuff we saw in our previous video where we were identifying points on a circle. So for example, if we want to do some practice examples, let's make a table of some values. We're going to set up a big table here. We're going to start with, I'm going to come all the way to the left, some number of degrees, which we can convert to radians. We're going to draw a picture that helps us see what angle we're talking about. And then we should be able to find the sine, the cosine, the tangent, the cosecant, the secant, and the cotangent. We should be able to find all six trig functions for any angle. Let's start with a 150 degree angle. And it might help to jump right to the drawing here. 150 degrees is 30 less than 80. So it's over here. Notice the long side's going to be root 3 over 2, and the short side's going to be 1 half. And we know in radians, we're counting 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's 5 pi over 6 radians. We also know sine is the y coordinate, which is how far up we go, which is 1 half. Cosine, we know, is the x coordinate. And because we're going to the left, that's the square root of 3 over 2. Those we already know. For the tangent, though, tangent, we take the y divided by x. We'll do the 1 half divided by root 3 over 2, negative root 3 over 2, because it's to the left. And what's nice about this is we can see that the divide by 2's, both on the top and bottom, reduce out. And so we just have to rationalize that denominator by multiplying by root 3 over 3. And we get a negative root 3 over 3 for the tangent. The cosecant, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So if I flip the sine over, the reciprocal of 1 half is 2. For the secant, the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. So the reciprocal of the cosine is going to be negative 2 over the square root of 3. We probably want to rationalize that denominator by multiplying by root 3 over 3. So that gives me negative 2 root 3 over 3 is the secant of 150 degrees, or 5 pi over 6. Let's actually circle these answers so they don't get lost in the work. And for the cotangent, the cotangent is going to be the reciprocal of the tangent. And notice we had two equivalent fractions. If we take the reciprocal before rationalizing, we don't have to rationalize again, which is nice, which gives us negative root 3 over 1 or just negative square root of 3. And so we're able to find all six trig ratios for 150 degrees, or 5 pi over 6. Let's try another one. Let's do, this time I'll start with the radians. Let's do 7 pi over 4. And if I draw that picture, over 4 is the quarter. So 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7 pi over 4. It's this one in the bottom right in the fourth quadrant. It's right in the middle, so we know it's root 2 over 2 both directions. It's also 45 degrees less than 360. So if I do 360 minus 45, I'll get 315 degrees. So I know that's 315 degrees. And we should be able to fill in the sine and cosine quickly at this point. Sine is root 2 over 2. But it's negative because the sine, the y coordinate, is down. 
The cosine is to the right, so it's positive root 2 over 2. Let's go ahead and circle those because those are final answers. And then for the tangent, we're going to divide the sine divided by the cosine, or the y divided by x. Root 2 over 2 divided by root 2 over 2. And the y, the numerator, is negative. So when we simplify that, we know the answer is going to be negative. And what's nice is anything divided by itself is 1. For the cosecant, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So if we flip the sine over or flip the y-coordinate over, we get 2 over negative square root of 2. And so if we rationalize the denominator by multiplying by root 2 over 2, we get 2 root 2 over 2. And the 2's divide out, so the cosecant is just the square root of 2. And of course, I'm not going to lose that negative sign that came with it. So the cosecant is negative square root of 2. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. And you can see in much the same way, we'll take the reciprocal and rationalize the denominator. It's just going to be the positive square root of 2. Positive because the cosine is positive, so the reciprocal has to be positive. For the cotangent, the cotangent is going to be the reciprocal of the tangent. I don't think I drew the connecting lines. Cotangent's the reciprocal of the tangent. The reciprocal of negative 1 is just negative 1. And we've now found the six trig ratios of 7 pi over 4, or 315 degrees. Let's do one more, maybe one that's a little more interesting. Let's do 90 degrees, which we should know is pi over 2. If we draw that picture, 90 degrees or pi over 2 is straight up. And so we know the coordinates are over 0, up 1, which means the sine is the y-coordinate, 1. The cosine is the x-coordinate, 0. And the tangent is y divided by x. y is 1 divided by x is 0. And what's interesting here, you'll see, is 1 divided by 0 is undefined. The tangent of 90 degrees, or pi over 2, does not exist. It is undefined because we cannot divide by 0. For the cosecant, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. The reciprocal of 1 is 1. Secant, secant's the reciprocal of cosine, but the reciprocal of 0 is 1 over 0, which again, we're going to say is undefined and does not exist. So what we're finding is all six trig ratios don't necessarily always exist. The cotangent, though, does exist because the reciprocal of 1 over 0, tangent was 1 over 0, is 0 over 1. And 0 over 1 does exist. 0 over 1 is 0. And so now we end up with our six trig ratios, sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, which is the reciprocal of sine, secant, which is the reciprocal of cosine, and cotangent, which is the reciprocal of tangent. Those relationships are going to be very important to us, especially when we get into our next chapter. But for now, we're just going to get used to calculating the values. And we're going to do something else that we did in our previous video. But this time, we're going to extend it to all six trig ratios. If the cosine of theta is equal to 3 fifths and theta is in quadrant, let's do 4. we draw a picture of that, theta is in quadrant 4. And what's important there is that the x is positive, because we're going to the right, and the y is negative, because we're going down. Now, in our previous video, we learned that sine squared of theta 
plus cosine squared of theta always equals 1. We know that cosine is 3 fifths, so we have sine squared of theta plus 3 fifths squared is equal to 1. Simplifying, we have sine squared of theta plus 9 over 25 equals 1. Subtracting the 9 over 25 leaves behind 16 over 25. And taking the square roots of both sides, we know that the sine of theta is 4 fifths plus or minus 4 fifths. With this information, then we should be able to fill in all the trig functions. Sine of theta, the sine has to be negative because it's the y-coordinate. We already know the y-coordinate's negative. Sine is negative 4 fifths. Cosine of theta was given to us. That's 3 fifths. Tangent of theta is y over x, or sine over cosine. Tangent's negative 4 fifths divided by 3 fifths. And the over 5s are going to reduce out. And so we're just left with the tangent being negative 4 thirds. From here, the last three trig ratios should come quickly. The cosecant of theta. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, so it must be negative 5 fourths. The secant of theta is the reciprocal of the cosine, so that must be 5 thirds. And the cotangent of theta is the reciprocal of the tangent, so it must be negative 3 fourths. The six trig ratios are going to come up in many different contexts as the course develops. Yes, we use sine and cosine the most and tangent next. But the other reciprocal ratios do come up in some interesting applications as we move forward. So take a look at practicing some of these on the assignment. Let me know if you have any questions. As we work with these trig functions, it's also helpful to be familiar with how the graphs of these functions behave. Specifically in this video, we're going to take a look at the graph of sine x and cosine x. And that's basically our question as well. What do the graphs of sine x and cosine x look like? And there are actually many applications of sine and cosine graphs. And we'll take a look at some of them towards the end of this video. But first, we need to build the sine x graph. And what we know about sine x is that sine x is the y-coordinate. It is the height or y-coordinate. So if I draw a unit circle over here, And then right next to it, we'll draw a graph. And we'll kind of line up the height of 1 and the bottom height of negative 1, because it is a unit circle. And what we'll do, just for the sake of this graph to get an idea of what's going on, we're going to label every pi over 4 at about equidistant lengths. So we've got pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, pi, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, 7 pi over 4, and then 2 pi. Those are about equidistant apart. And what's nice about each of those distance is those distance represent the quarters and the tops and the edges of the circle. And let's go ahead and label uh, this unit circle as well. So we've got a pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, pi, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, um, 
7 pi over 4, and finally 2 pi, but it's also 0 as well. And what I can do then, you notice 3 pi over 4 and 1 pi over 4 all have the same y coordinate. They all have the same height. So if I stretch that across, pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4 will have the same height. Similar, pi over 5 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4 are just down below the x-axis. So 5 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4 are low points. Pi over 2, we've already said, is kind of at the top. And 3 pi over 2, we've already said, is at the bottom. The only other observation that I see is 0 pi and 2 pi have a height of 0, so they're right on the x-axis. And so what we end up with with all these dots is a nice graph that we can connect the dots on. And we see it's kind of this nice little smooth up, down, back up. And that's where we get the idea of the graph of sine of x. Sine of x. What I want to notice, let's leave that on the screen, actually. What I want to notice about sine of x is it starts at 0. increases to 1, and that happens at pi over 2, then down to negative 1, and that happens at 3 pi over 2, then back to 0, and that happens at 2 pi. If I were to extend this graph, this graph doesn't actually necessarily stop where we stopped it. It goes, continues to go up and back down. And on the left side, it continues to go down and back up. It actually goes on forever with this wiggle shape. So let's go ahead and show what that looks like by drawing a graph that's centered in the middle here. And We'll label every pi over 2, because that's where the exciting stuff happens. Pi over 2 is the peaks, or the valleys, or the middles. So pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, 5 pi over 2, 3 pi, and then it would keep going. We can also go off on the left at negative pi over 2, negative pi negative 3 pi over 2, negative 2 pi, negative 5 pi over 2, and negative 3 pi. And it's going to have a height of 1 or down to negative 1. We said sine starts at 0, and it increases to 1 at pi over 2. Then it's going to decrease down, hitting 0 and negative 1 at 3 pi over 2. And then increases up to 0, 1, and back down to 0. Going the other way, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0. And that happens every pi over 2. And so we end up with this curve that is the sine curve. That's just going to kind of go on and on and on, representing all the heights of the unit circle at any given point. Sine x is very similar to cosine x. Cosine, though, is the x coordinate. And if I think about my unit circle, we're not going to build it. But cosine x being the x coordinate, you see it should start at 1. And then the x-coordinate's going to decrease. And so we end up with kind of a shift of the sine x. It's going to start at 1, decrease to negative 1, which is going to happen at pi. Then increase back to 1, which happens at 2 pi. 
So let's take a look at the graph of cosine of x. Same idea. We'll label pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, 5 pi over 2, and 3 pi on the right. On the left, negative pi over 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, negative 2 pi, negative 5 pi over 2, and negative 3 pi. We'll give it a height of 1 and negative 1. And the graph is going to start up at 1 because the cosine of 0 is 1. And then every pi over 2 will hit 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1. Going backwards, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1. And it has the same curvy shape to it. It's just kind of staggered from the sign by that distance of pi over 2. And so these are our graphs of sine of x and cosine of x. Now, as we do various transformations and translations of sine and cosine of x, it's important that we're familiar with some key terms that are going to describe these graphs. Some key terms. The first key term that we want to be able to talk about is what's called the midline. This is the horizontal line through the middle of the graph. And it usually starts at y equals 0 if there's no transformation. So if we scroll up to our sine and cosine graphs, the midline would be the x-axis, basically, going right through the middle of the graph. And technically, it should be directly on top, but I have to stagger it so we can see the red line. But that red line is the midline. The second key term that we want to be familiar with is what's called the amplitude. And this is the height of the sine or cosine graph from the midline. And the amplitude, we usually use the letter A, starts at 1 unless there's some type of vertical or horizontal stretch on the graph. So if you see from our sine and cosine graphs, the amplitude is the height from the midline. It goes up a distance of 1, and it also goes down a distance of 1. That's the amplitude, how far up and down it's going to travel from the midline. And cosine and sine are both exactly the same. That amplitude measurement is 1. The third key term we need to know is what's called the period. The period is the distance of one revolution. And the period, we'll use p for period, starts out as being 2 pi, because that's the distance around the unit circle. That's when the graph is going to start to repeat. And what you'll see on the sine and cosine graph is if I just look at a distance of 2 pi, maybe from 0 to 2 pi, we get one revolution. On the sine graph, it goes up, down, and back up. And then that repeats over and over again. Every 2 pi, you'll see that graph is repeating. And then we're starting another period off on the left and the right. Same thing with the cosine graph. If I just look at 2 pi, you see it starts at the top, goes down, and back up to the starting. That's the period of 2 pi before the graph will start to repeat itself with another period of 2 pi. And every 2 pi, it repeats exactly the same. So those are our key terms, the midline, the amplitude, and the period. We need to be familiar with those key terms 
in order to transform the sine x and cosine x. And you sort of did this in pre-calc 1, where you had to transform x squared or x cubed or 1 over x by multiplying and stretching and adding and subtracting to slide it. We can do the same thing with sine of x. We'll have this general formula that a is equal to, or that f of x is equal to a sine of b times theta minus h plus k, or g of x is equal to a cosine of b theta minus h plus k. And the only difference here between f of x and g of x is the sine is going to start at 0 and increase. The cosine is going to start at 1 and decrease. What's nice about these graphs is we should be able to look at them and see that a is the amplitude or the height of the graph from the midline. If it's negative, the graph will flip upside down. So if a is negative on the sine graph, it's going to start at 0 and decrease. If a is negative on the cosine graph, it'll start at negative 1 and increase. It'll do the opposite. b changes the period. And it's not quite exactly perfect, because the period is always equal to 1 distance 2 pi divided by whatever b is. And so that's an important formula to know. You can also switch it around and say, if we need to know what b is, multiplying by b and dividing by p, we can take 2 pi divided by the period. And that'll tell us what the b should be. h you should recognize from transforming with x squared, x cubed, 1 over x. h is the horizontal shift. And remember, it's going to go the opposite of what you expect, because it's already negative. So if it's minus 5, it shifts to the right 5. If it's plus 5, it shifts to the left 5. The horizontal shift is backwards what you'd expect. And then d, the letter k, represents the vertical shift. And actually, we usually do this first as we build our graph. Because we need to know where the midline is going to be. The vertical shift affects the midline. We need to have the midline to draw the graph up and down from that midline. So let's take a look at a few graphs and see if we can actually create them. Let's start with the graph f of x equals 3 cosine of 2x plus 1. What I can see here is the amplitude is the number out front of 3. We've got a vertical shift from the plus 1 of up 1. So I know this midline is going to be at 1, not at 0. We also see that the period has been changed because we have a b. b is equal to 2. The period is 2 pi divided by b, which is 2. So this period's been shrunk down to pi. Now, there's no horizontal shift here uh, because there's no plus um, hanging out inside that cosine. So it's still going to be horizontally where we are used to seeing it. And so let's just start our graph from 0. And let's do two revolutions of the graph. 
So we know that the period is pi. So I'll put pi in the middle. 2 pi would be two revolutions. And we like to split that into quarters because that way we get our top, middle, bottom, top, middle, bottom pattern going on. So that's going to be pi over 2 and pi over 4. So 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, and 7 pi over 4. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up, and 1, 2, down. Let's go three down. First thing that I'm going to put on this is we've got our midline. I said we start with the midline. The vertical shift is up one. So I'm just going to put a little dotted line as my guide. Don't confuse that with an asymptote. That's just my guide. That's the middle of this cosine graph. The amplitude is three. So I need to go from the midline up one, two, three. Um, and that's going to be the top of my graph. Down 3, 1, 2, 3 is going to be the bottom of my graph. So I'll just go ahead and put a light blue line here. That's the top and bottom of my graph. Now I'm ready to start actually graphing my points. Since there's no horizontal shift, we'll start at 0. And cosine, we know, starts at the top, normally at 1, but this time at the top of my graph. And so we've got the top on the midline is my middle. The next point is the bottom. On the midline is my middle. Top, midline, bottom, midline, top. Hitting all of the points that we set on there. And that's going to give me my graph for 3 cosine 2x plus 1. And of course, it would continue on each side of the graph. It doesn't necessarily stop there. Let's try and graph a sine graph now. Let's graph f of x is equal to 2 sine of pi x plus pi minus 3. One thing we need to be careful of with this formula is the horizontal shift is kind of hidden inside the sign because it needs to be in parentheses multiplied by the b. We have to factor out the thing in front of x. So what we're actually going to graph is 2 sine, factor out the pi, of x plus 1 minus 3. And that's going to help us see all the pieces that we need. One piece that we need is the amplitude. That comes from the number up front. We're going to rise 2 from the midline. We have a vertical shift again of that midline of down 3. We also have a period shift. The period is always 2 pi divided by the b. 2 pi divided by pi is 2. So this period is actually going to be 2 wide. No pi is involved, which is nice. But this time, we also have a horizontal shift from the plus 1. That's going to move us left 1. So with the vertical shift moving us so far down, I'm going to Go ahead and graph it like this. I said we like to do at least two uh, revolutions. So the period is 2. So I'm going to put 2 in the middle and double that 4 to get another revolution. And we're going to want to split that in half. I'm sorry, we want to split that in quarters. So 1 and 3, so we've actually got 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves, and 7 halves as our other key points. With the horizontal shift of left 1, let's also include negative 1 half and negative 1 so we can see where those are. And 
And then let's give us some height down, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and we'll go down to negative 5. Give us a little more space to see what we're graphing. Now, the vertical shift has been negative 3. So we're going to go 1, 2, 3. Our midline is going to be down here at negative 3. The amplitude is 2. So if I count up from the midline 1, 2, we get the top of our graph. And down 2, we get the bottom of our graph. And so the graph is going to kind of be in between those lines. And as we start to graph it, the horizontal shift is left 1. So it's actually going to start at that negative 1 point. And since it's a sine curve, sine normally starts at 0. Sine starts at the midline. And we know sine starts increasing to the top, to the midline, to the bottom, to the midline, to the top to the midline, and I'm just going every single tick mark, going through this pattern, filling in my graph. And we get this nice little sine curve. And that is 2 sine pi x plus 1 minus 3. Now, I mentioned one of the great things about these graphs is they have many applications. Quite often, they can help us specifically graph how circles are moving around their center point over time. For example, the tallest Ferris wheel At least at the time of me making this video, I'm told there's one in development that's going to be taller soon, has a diameter of 520 feet. If the lowest point starts 30 feet in the air, because it's, it's on a platform that lifts it up. It's actually on a platform. You could call it a platform. It's actually a large building. And completes a rotation every 30 minutes. Find a function to model the height over time. For this, it's going to help to draw a picture. And then we should be able to pull out of the picture all the important information of this Ferris wheel. First, we've got this Ferris wheel. It's got a diameter of 520 feet. It's also on a platform. That is 30 feet in the air. And if we were to graph this, we'll put the bottom of the graph on the ground. You can see that you get on at the bottom. You get on here at 30 feet in the air. And then you ride around, and you get up to this highest point. So you see how we can ride around to the highest point, And then you're going to come down to the bottom. In fact, let's go ahead and label the bottom of the circle and the top of the circle. And you can see how you ride the Ferris wheel in what becomes a sine or a cosine curve. Another important piece of information we need for any curve, though, is where the midline is. So let's see if we can figure out some key points. We know the entire circle has a diameter of 520 feet, which means half of the diameter is 260 feet. 
we're going up and down 260 feet from the midline. That tells me that the amplitude is 260 feet. We also need to know where that midline is, though. We started 30 feet in the air. And then we need to increase to the midline another 260 feet. That midline is at 290 feet. Midline is 290 feet. The other piece of information we need to know is how long does it take to complete one revolution of this graph? Basically, what's one period? We're told it completes a rotation every 30 minutes. So the period is 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes, it completes a full circle. We should be able to use this information to make our function. We know our function is going to be f of x equals a sine or cosine. Hmm, let's decide that now. This graph starts at the bottom and works up. Because it starts at the top or the bottom, that's going to be a cosine graph of b times theta plus h plus k. So plugging in the pieces we have now, a is the amplitude, 260. But cosine normally starts at the top and works down. This one starts at the bottom and works up. To get that opposite sign, we'll use a negative. So negative 260 cosine of b. Well, b comes from the period. But remember, b is equal to 2 pi divided by the period of 30. So b is actually going to be pi over 15. And it should actually be a minus h in the formula, right? I wrote that down wrong. OK. Times theta, there's really no h horizontal shift. It starts at 0 where we expected it to start. Plus k, that's where the midline moved to, 290 feet. And now we have a function that should be able to predict how high a person is on this Ferris wheel. In fact, we can even ask questions now such as, how high is a person after 10 minutes? So on my graph, if I split the 30 into third, 10 minutes, the person's right here somewhere. It's not really to scale. But um, it looks like it may be a little bit higher than the midline. We can find that out by plugging 10 minutes into our variable. And actually, I said f of x, so I should have an x in there. Or I could change it to f of theta. So we want to find how high after 10 minutes. Well, that's negative 260 cosine of pi over 15 times 10 plus 290. I can do that on my calculator. I want to make sure my mode is set in radians, because we did everything in radians. We've got negative 260 cosine of pi over 15 times 10, close the parentheses on the cosine, plus 290. And we find out that our height is 420 feet in the air. So today, there's two big concepts that you need to be familiar with. One, you should know what the sine and cosine graphs look like. Sine starts at 0, increasing. Or I should say sine starts at the midline and increases. Cosine starts either at the top or bottom. And then from that, you should be able to look at how to transform sine and cosine based on the amplitude, a change in period, a horizontal shift, and a vertical shift. 
Take a look at the homework to practice some of these, and let me know if you have any questions. In our previous video, we took a look at graphing sine and cosine and looked at the wiggle that came out of those two graphs and how we could transform it. But we haven't talked about the other four trig ratios. And that's the question we're going to answer today is how do we graph other trig functions? And we're going to start with the reciprocals of sine and cosine, the cosecant of x and the secant of x. So first, we'll look at the cosecant of x, which we know is the reciprocal of the sine of x. And we actually know quite a bit about reciprocal functions and what they look like. And so let's graph. Let's graph a little more than two periods worth of the sine of x. So sine of x goes to 2 pi normally. So half of that's pi, half of that's pi over 2. And in the middle is 3 pi over 2. And let's also go negative pi over 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, and negative 2 pi. And we know that the sine of x goes from 0 to 1. So let's label where 1 and negative 1 is. And sine starts at 0, because the sine of 0 is 0, increases to the top, to the middle, to the bottom, to the middle, going the other direction, to the bottom, to the middle, to the top, to the middle. And so if we connect the dots, what we get is this nice sine function. We're going to use this blue graph to create the reciprocal function, which is the cosecant. And if you remember from pre-calc 1, reciprocal functions, whenever we have a 0, is going to become a vertical asymptote. So the reciprocal of 0 is infinity, or a vertical asymptote. So all of these zeros I'm going to change to vertical asymptotes. And what's nice is the reciprocal of something close to 0 is close to infinity. And the reciprocal of 1 is 1. And so what we end up with is this curve that comes down and kisses the top of the sine graph, and then comes in from the bottom and kisses the bottom of the sine graph. And similarly on top, then on the bottom, and so forth. And so if I were to go through and actually erase the blue line, what's left, the green, is the graph of cosecant of x. It's a reciprocal graph of the sine function. Now, we could go through a very similar process to graph the secant, which is the reciprocal of cosine. And it would much look like the same graph. We're just going to move all the vertical asymptotes over to where its reciprocal cosine hits the x-axis. But let's make these a little bit more interesting by adding the transformations to our graphs. Let's graph 2 cosecant of pi over 2 theta plus 1. Well, what we know is cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So we're going to graph the reciprocal function to sine of pi over 2 theta plus 1, which means the midline we know goes up 1 because of the plus 1. We also know the amplitude is 2 because of the 2 in front of the sine. And we know the period is 2 pi divided by whatever is in front of the theta, which is pi over 2. And I can simplify that by multiplying by 2 on top and bottom. Also, when we do that, the pi's divide out. So we're just left with 4. So the period is 4. And I can use that information to start to make my graph. I'm going to scroll down 
I'm going to put some of the information off the screen just so that we can see it well. And let's go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we'll go down 1, 2, 3, 4. The period is 4. So let's go a period of 4 backwards, 1 period forwards. And let's actually go 2 periods forward. And we have to split that into quarters, which is nice. That's negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we're going to graph the sign first. So the midline went up 1. So that blue line represents the midline. The amplitude is 2, so I know it's going to increase 2 from the midline and decrease 2 from the midline to negative 1. I also know that it's a sine graph, and sine starts at the midline. So I know we're at the midline, to the top, to the middle, to the bottom, to the middle, to the top, to the middle, to the bottom, to the middle. Same thing to the left, bottom, middle, top, middle. And so we end up with this nice little graph. But because we aren't actually graphing the sine, we want to graph the cosecant. Cosecant is going to be the reciprocal. Wherever we hit the midline is going to create a vertical asymptote. So wherever I see the graph hit the midline, I'm going to add a vertical asymptote to the graph. And then the reciprocal is going to come off of that. And in this way, we end up with this nice little repetitive cosecant graph. And we just have to erase the sine graph. And what's left is the cosecant graph. And so now we have the graph of 2 cosecant pi over 2 theta plus 1. Now, we haven't done any secants yet, but I told you the idea is exactly the same with the secant. So let's try a secant problem. Let's graph 1 half secant of 2 pi theta minus 2 pi minus 3. Now again, we're going to first graph the reciprocal graph. And then we'll use that to guide the actual secant graph. This is the reciprocal of 1 half of a cosine. Now, to help us out here, we know with the cosine, we're going to want to factor out the 2 pi to help us with the period and the horizontal shift, which is theta minus 1, and a minus 3 at the end. So I know the midline, because of the minus 3, is down 3. I know the amplitude, because of the 1 half in front, is 1 half. I know the period is 2 pi divided by the v, which is another 2 pi, which is nice. That reduces to 1. And this time, we also have a horizontal shift. Because of that minus 1 in the parentheses, it's going to move to the right one unit. So when we want to graph this one, the period is 1, so let's do 1 and 2. We'll also add a negative 1. We split it into quarters to get all of our key points, which gives us negative 1 half, negative 1 fourth, and negative 3 fourths, 1 fourth, 1 half, 3 fourths, 5 fourths, 3 halves, 7 fourths. And because we're going to do a reciprocal, we'll add a couple more lines than we need to. We'll go 1, 2, 3, and negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And first, we're going to graph that cosine. We know the midline has moved down 3. Oh, well, let's move down 3. 
I should probably actually then extend this graph even lower than I thought. Negative 4, negative 5, negative 6. So the midline moved down 3. That's the midline. The amplitude is only 1 half. So it's going to only come up 1 half and down 1 half. We've covered the period already of 1. Horizontal, it's going to move right 1. So it's going to start at 1. And since it's a cosine, it should start at the top at 1. And then as we go across to our tick marks, middle, bottom, middle, top, going the other way, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top. And we end up with this nice little cosine graph. But again, we didn't want to draw a cosine. We wanted to draw its reciprocal, the secant. In that case, everywhere where it hits the midline, we should have a vertical asymptote. And then the graph's going to curve up from the asymptote and hit the peak, down and up, down and up. And so we end up with this nice secant graph. Erase the blue cosine graph, and what's left in green is the secant graph that we were trying to draw. So secant and cosecant graphs, all we have to do is draw the reciprocal graph first, and then use the midline to make the asymptotes. And then we can make our u's and upside down u's within the asymptotes. But we still have to talk about tangent and cotangent. So let's look at those next. Tangent x and cotangent x. And we're going to start with tangent x just because we use that more often. And to help us out, we're going to actually build tangent with x and y coordinates, where y is equal to the tangent of x. So if x is 0, we should know from our unit circle that our tangent is 0. When x is pi over 6, y becomes 1 over the square root of 3, because the 2's divide out if you're thinking about your unit circle. At pi over 6, it's root 3 over 2 comma 1 half. And when we divide the y coordinate by the x coordinate, we get 1 over the square root of 3. And if I plug that in my calculator, We'll call that 0. 0.6, which will be good enough for our graph. Pi over 4 is 1. Pi over 3, the tangent of pi over 3 becomes the square root of 3, which is approximately 1.7. Pi over 2 is interesting because pi over 2, you'll remember, is 0, 1. That becomes 1 divided by 0, which is undefined. When it's undefined, we end up with a vertical asymptote. If we do the negatives, you'll find you get the exact same va values as the positives. So negative pi over 6 ends up being approximately negative 0.6. Negative pi over 4 becomes approximate, no, exactly, actually, negative 1. And pi over 3 becomes approximately negative 1.7. And the negative pi over 2 is also going to be undefined. So let's make a graph of what we learned here. I'm going to label similar to how we labeled before, where we labeled every pi over 4. So we'll have a pi over 4 pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, pi, let's go backwards, negative pi over 4, negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 4, and negative pi. And on the x-axis, we'll go 1, 2, 3, and negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and see what this looks like. 
So we've got a point at 0, 0. Pi over 6 is not quite pi over 4. It's close, but it's going to go up 0. 0.6, a little more than half. At pi over 4, we should be at 1. Pi over 3 is a little bit more, should be at 1.7. And then at pi over 2, we're undefined, which means we have a vertical asymptote. Going the other way, we've got negative pi over 6, comma, negative 0. 0.6, negative pi over 4, comma, negative 1, negative pi over 3. I lost my negative sign there, but it's negative 1.7. And then at pi over 2, we end up with a vertical asymptote. And when we connect the dots and use the vertical asymptotes, we see tangent becomes this curve going between the asymptote. And actually, it turns out if we keep going, every pi over 2, there'll be another vertical asymptote. So this graph is going to come up again and level out at pi. And then at 3 pi over 2, it comes up. Similarly, at negative pi, it's going to level off. And we end up with this is the graph of tangent of x. Since this is tangent of x, we should be able to use tangent to build its reciprocal in much the same way we did with secant and cosecant. So let's take a look at the cotangent of x and see how it compares. First, I'm going to draw a couple periods of the tangent of x. And what we found was every pi over 2 was interesting. So pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, and we'll go 5 pi over 2. That's probably enough negative pi over 2, negative pi, negative 3 pi over 2, negative 2 pi, negative 5 pi over 2. And what we found out was with the tangent, I'm going to do the tangent in blue. With the tangent, there was a vertical asymptote at pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and 5 pi over 2. Same with the negatives, negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2, and negative 5 pi over 2. Then the graph would touch in the center. So it's going to increase and bend over, increase and bend over up, increase, bend over up, increase, bend over up, increase, bend over up. cotangent then becomes the reciprocal of this function. I'm going to do the cotangent of x in green. Hopefully, we can differentiate. And what we found with reciprocals is a 0 becomes a vertical asymptote. So all the zeros of the tangent are vertical asymptotes of the cotangent. And similarly, the opposite is true. The vertical asymptotes become a 0. And so if I add a 0 at all the vertical asymptotes, this is getting crowded. But maybe if I remove all the blue stuff, you'll see we've got much the same setup that we had before. Cotangent is just going to bend the other way. What I notice about the tangent graph and the cotangent graph is they both have a period of pi. The tangent graph, though, has asymptotes. pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, et cetera. And actually, it should be plus or minus on each of those. 
The cotangent being the reciprocal has asymptotes at plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi, et cetera. Another interesting thing to note is going from left to right, tangent is always increasing, while cotangent is always decreasing. So with this information in mind, let's try one graph. Let's find the period of y equals 3 cotangent of 3 pi over 2 theta and graph it. Well, the thing we know about the period from sine, cosine, cosecant, and secant is we take the original period and divide by the b out front. Well, the original period is now just pi, and we divide by 3 pi over 2. Well, we clear the fraction by multiplying by 2. And what's nice is even the pi's divide out. So here, the period is 2 thirds. The 3 out front becomes a vertical stretch. It's not really an amplitude, but it is stretched vertically of 3. So we're going to see this graph kind of get taller quicker. It's a cotangent graph. So cotangents have, have asymptotes starting at pi and then every period after that. So we actually will end up with, if I go 1, 2, and negative 1, negative 2, every 2 thirds, there should be a vertical asymptote. So there's, we're going to split these units into thirds to help us out. So at 2 thirds, there's a vertical asymptote. 2 more thirds, vertical asymptote. 2 more thirds, vertical asymptote. Go in the other direction. At 0, vertical asymptotes. 2 thirds, vertical asymptotes. 2 more thirds, vertical asymptote. 2 more thirds, vertical asymptote. It's a cotangent, so it's always decreasing. And so it's going to decrease, hitting the center each time. And we've got our graph. I've kind of missed the center a couple times. We'll just put a big dot on each one to show it's going through the center. And that becomes our cotangent graph. All right, now that we've covered how to graph all these, it is your turn to practice some of these. Practice results in experience, which results in the knowledge and the comfortable uh, feeling with working with these graphs. So please take the time to practice these. Take a look at the homework. Let me know if you have any questions. A concept we haven't had a chance to work with much is doing these trig functions in reverse. And this is really how you make sure you know your trig functions really well, especially that unit circle. We're going to ask the question, how do we find the angle given a trig point? So given a point on the unit circle, can we go backwards and figure out what angle built that point. And this sets up this idea of inverse trig functions. For example, if I wanted to find the sine inverse of the square root of 2 over 2. First, a bit of notation. That little negative 1 on the sine is not an exponent. That act symbol actually means sine inverse. Sometimes, actually, to clarify, you'll see it not called the sine inverse, but sometimes we'll call it the arc sine of the square root of 2 over 2. That's the exact same thing. What it's asking for is what point on the unit circle helps us find the angle 
that we are looking for. So if I were to draw my little unit circle, I should recognize root 2 over 2 comes from that center angle. Sine is the y-coordinate, but actually both sine and cosine are the same when that angle is pi over 4. The point is root 2 over 2 comma root 2 over 2. We're looking for the y. So that equals the angle pi over 4. And we can work backwards with the cosine, too. We can do our cosine inverse, let's say, of negative 1 half. That would be the same as saying the arc cosine of negative 1 half. And again, we just have to draw a little unit circle. Cosine being the x-coordinate, that tells me it's negative. So we're going to go backwards. And 1 half is the shorter distance. So I want to go backwards the shorter distance. So we know then at 2 pi over 3, the coordinate point is backwards 1 half and up root 3 over 2. And because cosine is the x, then that 2 pi over 3 must be my angle. Arc cosine is the exact same thing. And we can do an arc tangent as well. Let's do the tangent inverse of the square root of 3, which is the same thing as the arc tangent of the square root of 3. And so again, we draw our unit circle. And tangent, we know, is y over x. And so we want root 3 over 1. And usually with tangent, the over 2 divides out. So that tells me the y coordinate is root 3 over 2. The x coordinate is 1 half. So it's a little bit of x and a lot of y. That gives us 1 pi over 3 is at the point 1 half comma root 3 over 2. So tangent inverse, or the arc tangent of the square root of 3 must be 1 pi over 3. Now, there's a little bit of problem with the way we've defined the inverse sine, cosine, and tangent at this point. And that problem comes from the fact that with example 1, the inverse sine is exactly the same on the other side of the circle. Same with the cosine. The inverse cosine is exactly the same on the other side of the circle going through the x-axis, because cosine is the x. And with tangent, Tangent ends up giving you the same value if you go diagonally through the circle. So what we need to do to prevent confusion of multiple possible answers, what we're going to do is we are going to limit the domain for clarity. So we know exactly which one we're looking at. And so with the sign, Sine comes from the y-coordinate. So on my unit circle, we always like to use the first quadrant. And then I need to account for negatives on the y-coordinate. And so we'll just use the quadrant right next to it. And so we're going to say sine is going to go from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So sine inverse of x has a domain from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Similarly, when we do the cosine, cosine looks at the x-coordinate. So if I draw my little unit circle, we always like to use the first quadrant. Then I need to account for negatives on the x-coordinate. Well, negatives on the x-coordinate would be over here to the top left. And so we're going to say the cosine is going to go from 0 to pi. So cosine inverse of x has a domain from 0 to pi.
for the tangent. Well, tangent uses both the x and the y coordinate. So we actually had some choices with tangent for which one we wanted to do. So again, on the unit circle, we always use the first quadrant. And after much debate, we could have gone either direction to get the negative tangents. After much debate, it's decided to go with the fourth quadrant. And so it's going to have the same domain as the sine. It's going to go from negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2. So we could have gone either way, but it was decided long ago when we've stuck with it that the domain of tangent is from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So if you look up at the examples that we just did, notice example 1, the sign could have been over here on the left at 3 pi over 4. But sine only uses the right side, so we didn't have to worry about that one. With the cosine inverse, it could have been down here at 5 pi over 3. But cosine only uses the top half, so we didn't have to worry about that. Similarly, with the tangent, it could have been down here at 5 pi over 3. But again, we only used the right quadrant, so we just ignored that one as well. So restricting the domain gives us only one possible answer, even though another one does exist that you want to make sure you're aware of. But most of the time when working with the inverse trig, we're going to limit the domain. And in fact, that's exactly what your calculator is going to do as well. So first, with the calculator, make sure you're in the correct mode, degrees or radians. So if I look at mode, right now I'm in radians on my calculator. So I'm going to do these problems in radians. We can find the sine inverse of maybe 0.43 radians. So on my calculator, I'll hit second. And then the sine button will give me the sine inverse of 0.43 radians. And that tells me we've got about 44, 0.44 radians. Let's say we've got a cosine inverse of 0.43. We'll hit second cosine inverse of 0.43. And that tells me we get an x value of 0.43 at 1 point around 13 radians. I could also find the tangent inverse on my calculator of 0.43. To make y divided by x equal to 0.43, we'll do the tangent inverse of 0.43, close the parentheses, and we get 0.41. So the calculator is really nice. We don't usually solve problems so directly as this. We solve problems where we've got a triangle. And we saw this back at the beginning of our trick. We've got a triangle with sides of 5 and 7. We want to know what the angle theta is equal to. Well, from theta, 5 is the opposite, and 7 is the adjacent. So that's going to be the tangent of theta is equal to the opposite over the adjacent 5 sevenths. And so theta is going to be the tangent inverse of the 5 sevenths. And in degrees, if I want degrees, maybe we should hit mode first, change it over to degrees. We can do the second tangent inverse of 5 sevenths. And it'll tell me the number of degrees, 35.5, that that angle is. But again, it's really important before you hit sine inverse, cosine inverse, or tangent inverse, you know how many degrees you are talking about with the problem. We can make these problems a little more exciting as we look at composing a trig function 
with an inverse trig function. Let's look at that. Composition with trig and inverse trig. First, we're going to look at the inverse of some trig function. What I mean by that is we're going to have some inverse function, maybe cosine inverse of a trig function, maybe the sine of, let's do 11 pi over 6. And when we're doing these type of problems, we can really just follow the order of operations, and it falls out quite nicely. Looking at the sine of 11 pi over 6, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 pi over 6. So I can see that's the long distance of root 3 over 2 and a short distance down negative 1 half. Sine is the y coordinate. So now we have the cosine inverse of negative 1 half. And then we look for where the cosine is negative 1 half. And remember, cosine only looks at the top half of the circle. So a negative means we're going backwards. 1 half is a short distance. And so we know that distance at negative 1 half comma root 3 over 2 happens when the angle is 2 pi over 3. So our final answer is 2 pi over 3. Now, that's not really that exciting because it's just order of operations and working through what we already know. Let's try what might be a little bit more of an interesting problem. That is calculating the trig of some inverse. In other words, we're going to see something like a sine of an inverse function, which means cosine. And to help us out with this trig inverse, we're going to actually draw the triangle and be careful to watch our signs. What I mean by that is we're doing the cosine inverse of 2 thirds. Well, if I draw a triangle here from our angle theta that we don't know, Cosine is adjacent over the hypotenuse. That means the missing angle using the Pythagorean theorem is 3 squared equals 2 squared plus b squared, or 9 equals 4 plus b squared. So b squared is 5, and b is plus or minus the square root of 5. And that plus or minus is important because we don't actually know if it's going up or down. So the sine of this triangle, the sine of the angle is going to be the opposite, plus or minus the square root of 5, over the hypotenuse 3. So how do I know if it's a positive or if it's a negative? Well, it all started with the cosine inverse. And we know cosine inverse is going to give us a value that is on the top of the circle. If we have to be on the top of the circle, the sign here is always positive. Sine is the y-coordinate. The y-coordinate is always positive. So we're going to use the positive answer and say our final answer is positive root 5 over 3. Let's try another one just to make sure we're comfortable with that drawing the triangle. Let's do the cosine of the tangent inverse 
of negative 3 fourths. Now, right away, I should be thinking tangent inverse is going to come from the right side. And we're going to do a cosine, which is the x-coordinate. And the x-coordinate here is always positive when we take the cosine of a tangent inverse. So I already know my final answer is going to be positive. But let's draw the triangle and see what happens. Tangent inverse. Tangent is always going to be the opposite over the adjacent, negative 3 over 4. And if I use the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing side, c squared is negative 3 squared plus 4 squared. c squared is 9 plus 16. c squared is 25. So c is plus or minus 5. We are going to take the cosine of our angle. Cosine is the adjacent, 4, over the hypotenuse, 5. And we know the answer has to be positive. So it's going to be a positive 4 fifths. We can actually abstract this process a little bit and find the sine of the cosine inverse of maybe x over 7. Again, I know if we do a cosine inverse, cosine inverse will give me the top half of the circle. We're doing the sine of the cosine inverse, and the y-coordinates up here are all positive. So my answer is going to be positive. So I set up my triangle. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So x is the adjacent. Hypotenuse is 7. To find the missing side, we know that 7 squared is equal to x squared plus b squared, or 49 is equal to x squared plus b squared. Subtract the x squared from both sides. 49 minus x squared is equal to b squared and take the square root of both sides. And b is equal to plus or minus the square root of 49 minus x squared. Now that I know all the sides of the triangle, we're ready to find the sine of the angle theta, which is the opposite, plus or minus the square root of 49 minus x squared, all over the hypotenuse, which is 7. But again, we've established that it has to be positive. So for our final answer, it's the positive square root of 49 minus x squared over 7. So this is inverse trig, sometimes combining inverse trig with regular trig. We can do it on our calculators, or we can do it using what we know about the unit circle. Take a look at the homework assignment to practice a few of these, and let me know if you have any questions. Now that we've gotten good at solving inverse trig functions, we're ready to apply that by answering the question, how do we solve trig equations? And the short answer of how we solve the trig equations is we're going to use our inverse trig. But we're going to stretch that inverse trig and say, but without domain restrictions. So for example, if I want to know it, what the angle is for 2 cosine theta equals the square root of 3, we can solve this quickly by dividing both sides by 2 so that the cosine of theta is equal to root 3 over 2. And then I just need to think about my unit circle. Cosine's the x-coordinate, so we want a longer x-coordinate, which happens twice. The same x-coordinate, because cosine's off to the right, 
It happens at 1 pi over 6, and it also happens at 11 pi over 6. But 1 pi over 6 also has a coterminal angle if we loop around the entire circle at pi over 6 plus a 2 pi. In fact, we can circle around another time and do pi over 6 plus 4 pi. And we can keep going and going. Same thing for the 11 pi over 6. We can do 11 pi over 6 plus a 2 pi. Or we could do 11 pi over 6 plus a 4 pi. Or we could keep going and going and going. And so to express all the possible angles that satisfy 2 cosine theta equals root 3, we'll do one statement for each angle. At 11 pi over 6, we add, we're going to say, 2 k pi's. And k is the number of times around the circle. So that gives us 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi. And same with the 11 pi over 6, plus 2 k pi's, because that's going to rotate us. And so these two statements then become our solution for all of the possible solutions for that angle. Let's try another one so we can get an idea of finding that expression for all possible solutions. Let's do 2 times the sine of theta equals negative 1. Well, to get the sine alone, we divide by 2, and the sine of theta is equal to negative 1 half. So I draw my unit circle. Sine is the y coordinate, and I want it to be negative. So I want to go down just a little bit, which means we've got these two angles, 11 pi over 6 and 7 pi over 6, that have a y coordinate of down just a little bit. So we can say that our solution then is the 7 pi over 6 plus 2k pi. In other words, k revolutions around the circle. Or 11 pi over 6 plus 2k pi. And that gives us our complete solution. Sometimes we're given a domain restriction, though. If the domain restriction said from 0 to 2 pi, we would just have to list the values within the first revolution of the circle. So in that case, it would just be 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. So make sure you look, do we have a domain restriction, or does it want all the possible solutions? Sometimes we've got more than just theta for the angle. And what I mean by that is sometimes we're solving problems like 5 sine of 3 theta equals 5. And if we have more than just theta for the angle, in this case 3 theta, we're going to replace with u. In other words, for this one, we're going to say u is equal to those three thetas. And so we're going to actually solve 5 sine of u equals 5. And if I do that, dividing both sides by 5 gives me that the sine of u is equal to 1. Sine being the y coordinate, we know is 1 up here at pi over 2. So that tells us my solution for u is equal to pi over 2 plus 2k pi's, k revolutions of the circle. But we weren't actually solving for u. We were solving for 3 theta. So now we substitute back and say, OK, now we know 3 theta is equal to pi over 2 plus 2k pi. And we can solve this by dividing by 3, which puts a 3 in the denominator, or just dividing by 3 on the right. And we're left with theta equals pi over 6 plus 2 thirds of k pi. 
And that's going to give us all the solutions for 5 sine of 3 theta equals 5. Let's try another example for this. Let's try 2 cosine of 2 theta equals negative square root of 2. And let's give it a domain restriction from 0 to 2 pi. Same as before, we don't like the 2 theta, so we're going to make that u. And then we're going to now have 2 cosine of u equals negative square root of 2, which we can solve for the cosine of u by dividing by 2, giving us negative root 2 over 2, leading us to our unit circle. Cosine is the x-coordinate. We know we want x to be negative, so we're off to the left. And root 2 over 2 we know is right in the middle. There's just two options for it. That happens at 3 pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4. That one doesn't look like it's in the middle. Let's draw better middle angles. There we go. Now, because we've got a domain restriction, we don't have to do the plus 2k pi. But what I am going to notice is the angle's called 2 theta. That's going to double my distance around the circle. So we're going to do that here as well. We're going to go around the circle two times because we have 2 theta in the problem. So for my solutions for u, I'm going to say they're 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4. So we've got the 3, the 5. But then if I keep going around, we get another 2 pi, which is 8 plus 3, 11 pi over 4. And then going around to the last one, 5 plus 8 is 13 pi over 4. So we've gone around the circle twice. We added 2 pi to each of my first angles in order to cover the 2 theta inside the cosine. Because now when I convert back to the 2 theta, 2 theta is equal to 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 11 pi over 4, and 13 pi over 4. We're going to divide by 2, which sticks a 2 in each of these denominators. Dividing by 2 gives us theta is equal to 3 pi over 8, 5 pi over 8, 11 pi over 8, and 13 pi over 8. And now all of our solutions for theta are between 0 and 2 pi. Now all the problems we've solved so far have had nice pretty angles that we're used to working with. But we don't always have our common angles. So what do we do if we don't have our common angles? For example, if we've got the sine of x is equal to negative 0.29. Well, the short answer is we're going to use a calculator and find the other angle. So from here, we know x is going to be the sine inverse of the negative 0.29. We can do that on our calculator. And when we do it on our calculator, the calculator is going to say it knows the domain of the sign is just use the right side. And this y coordinate is negative, so it's going to be down somewhere. We don't know where exactly. Let's find that angle first. So we're going to type in, first checking the mode. I'm in radians. Good. Sine inverse of negative 0.29 gives us an angle of negative 0.294. But we don't really like to see negative angles. So let's say we know the full circle is 2 pi. And then we're going to back up the 0.294. So for our first angle, the full circle is 2 pi. And when we back up the 0.294, that should give us the angle we're looking for. 
I can type that in my calculator, 2 pi minus 0.294. We're at about 5.989. But there's also a second angle that has the same y-coordinate, if I draw a line through the y-axis, that, cal that the calculator does not tell me about. So I have to do a little bit of work to get there. What's nice is I know that it's got the same angle as the angle on the right. So in other words, this is 0.294 down from 1 pi, which is half the circle. So my second option for x is 1 full pi plus another 0.294. And when I put that in my calculator, it'll give me 3.436. And so now I've got the two angles that give me a sign of negative 0.29. This problem did not have a domain restriction, so we have to actually say that x is equal to 5.989, add the 2k pi, because we can rotate around the circle as many times as we want, and 3.436, add the 2k pi. And that's going to give us all solutions for this equation. Let's try one with a domain restriction, though. Let's do 3 cosine of x equals 1, and let's just do it on 0 to 2 pi. Well, we know right off we have to say cosine of x is equal to 1 third, and cosine inverse of 1 third is equal to our angle. If I think about my unit circle, cosine, we remember the domain is in the top half. Here, the cosine inverse is positive 1 3rd, so it's going to stick me somewhere in the first quadrant. We don't know where it is. Let's actually do that in purple. We don't know where that is exactly. The calculator is going to give that to us. Cosine inverse of 1 3rd, 1 1.23. So my first option for x is 1.23. My second option for x is going to have the same x-coordinate. So if I draw a line through the x-axis, it gives me a point with the same x-coordinate. Notice that that is 1.23 away from a full circle. If I do a full circle and back up 1.23, we get my angle. So 2 pi is the full circle, back up 1.23. And when I type that in my calculator, I get 5.052. So for my final answer, x is equal to 1.23 and 5.052. Because we have the domain restriction of one revolution of the circle, we stop there. Now, what if we combine both of these concepts together, solving with the calculator and having more than just theta or x in for my angle? Let's try to solve 7 cosine of 3x equals 4 on the domain of 0 to 2 pi. Similar to last time, instead of working with the 3x, we're going to make it a u. So 7 cosine of u equals 4. Dividing by 7 gives us the cosine of u is 4 sevenths. So we know u is equal to the cosine inverse of 4 sevenths. Thinking about my unit circle, cosine's the x-coordinate. 4 sevenths is positive, so the x-coordinate is going to be positive. Somewhere off to the right. We don't know where exactly. We'll use our calculator to figure out what that angle should be. The cosine inverse of 4 divided by 7, that angle is 0.963. 
So for our options for you, we've got 0.963. But because of the 3 in front of the angle, we're going to account for 3 revolutions of the circle. So we're going to add 2 pi to get the second revolution of the circle at 7.246. And then we'll add 2 pi again to get our third revolution of the circle, because it's 3x to get 13.529. So we've got three revolutions of the circle to account for the 3x. But that's not the only place that has the cosine we want. If I draw a line through the x, because cosine is the x, that gives us another angle at 0.963 down from the x-axis. But we can use much the same strategy. We know it's 2 pi all the way around, and so we'll back up a pi. So I'll do 2 pi all around, and then we back up the 0.963. 2 pi, back up the 0.963. 5.9. I'll just call it 5.32 is our next solution. But again, we're going to do three revolutions here as well. So we'll add 2 pi to get 11.603. And then for the third revolution, we'll add another 2 pi to get 17.887. But remember, u is equal to 3x. We're solving for x, so we're going to divide by 3 to get our final answers. And we're going to divide all six of these numbers by 3. And when we do, we'll just do it on our calculator really quick. 963 divided by 3 is 0.321. Then 7.246 divided by 3 is 2.415. And 13.529 divided by 3 is 0 4.510. 5.32. divided by 3, 1.773. And 11.603 divided by 3, 3.868. And finally, 17.887 divided by 3 is 5.962. And now you notice all of those are less than 2 pi. We have our six angles where 7 times the cosine of 3 times these values is equal to 4. So we're really getting comfortable with our inverse trig as we solve these equations with sines, cosines. And there could be a few tangents with much the same idea. Take a look at practicing these on your homework assignment. And let me know if you have any questions. Good luck. The whole point of doing mathematics is to model something in the real world so we can make predictions about the future. The better the model, the better the prediction, and ultimately more, the more someone will pay you to develop that model. So with all this trigonometry, let's look at how it can be used to model uh, some relationships using sine, cosine, and possibly some other functions. The question's going to be, how do we model the real world with trig. And ultimately, we're just going to dive right into some examples where we can see that happen. The first example we've actually already seen on one level. It's the Ferris wheel problem. Let's do a Ferris wheel problem and look at how it can help us answer questions. A Ferris wheel.
two feet off the ground. with a radius of 40 feet, rotates every 12 minutes. How long is a person above 35 feet in one rotation. Well, we've already seen Ferris wheels modeled. Ferris wheels on a stand, and it's got a wheel. And we can look at the measurement, the fact that it is two feet off the ground, and that the entire height is radius of radius of 40 feet. So it's not a diameter. The radius is 40 feet. So it's 40 feet to the middle, which then is interesting to note the middle of the Ferris wheel is actually 40 plus 2, 42 feet up. And so we can use this information to decide, OK, the midline of this graph must be up 42 feet. The amplitude of the graph, it increases 40 and decreases 40 as it rotates around the circle. And the period of this graph, we know, is it's going to rotate every 12 minutes. And we, therefore, from the period, know the b in our formula is going to be 2 pi divided by 12, or pi over 6. Also, we know when you get on a Ferris wheel, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. The graph that starts at the bottom and works its way up is the negative cosine. Cosine starts at either the top or the bottom, negative from the bottom, positive from the top. And so we can put all of this together using what we learned about functions, building functions and transformations of trig functions. We know f of x is equal to the amplitude, which is 40 but it's a negative 40 to account for the negative cosine of b, which is pi over 6 times theta, because there's no horizontal shift, plus the vertical shift to the midline of 42. Now, this question wants to know, though, how long are we above 35 feet? So what we can do is we can put 35 feet in the answer, because this is building the height of that we are. 35 is equal to negative 40 cosine of pi over 6 theta plus 42. And that's going to give us a function that we can solve to answer the question, how long are we in the air? We'll subtract 42 from both sides, trying to get the cosine alone. And that'll give us negative 7 equals negative 40 cosine of pi over 6 times theta. Divide both sides by the negative 40. And that makes it a positive 7 over 40 equals the cosine of pi over 6 theta. So going to our calculator then, making sure I'm in um, radian mode, because we use 2 pi for the b. So we need to come down here. It is in radians. Good. And we'll do the cosine inverse of 7 over 40. And we end up with 1.39. So we have 1.39 is equal to the pi over 6 theta. But that's not going to actually be the whole story. Because 1.39, that's positive over here. We know x should be positive. If we draw a line through the x-axis, because cosine is the x-axis, we should get another angle that has the same x-coordinate. Because remember, you're going to hit this value twice. When you're on the Ferris wheel, you'll go above 35 feet, 
and then you drop below 35 feet. Those are the two times you're going to hit it. So we know the first angle is 1.39. The second angle is 1.39 down from the horizontal. So to get that, we know it's 2 pi all the way around. And we come back 1.39. So our other option is 2 pi minus 1.39 is equal to the pi over 6 theta. And I can do that 2 pi minus 1.39 to find out that that angle is actually 4 point, let's round it to 89. 4.89 is equal to pi over 6 theta. We want to know what that theta actually is. So we're going to multiply by the reciprocal of 6 over pi on both sides of both equations, 6 over pi, 6 over pi. And when we do, we find our two answers for theta. Theta could be 2.65 minutes. Or with the 4.89, it comes out to about 9.34 minutes. So to answer the question, how long you're above that 35 feet, we just subtract 9.34 minus 2.65 and we end up with 6.69 minutes, oh, just over 6 and a half minutes, almost 6 and 3 quarter minutes. Out of that 12 minute rotation, you're going to actually be above 35 feet on this Ferris wheel. And that's one way that we can model with trigonometry. But let's take a look at another model that's also interesting. There's lots of places where we can model this type of behavior. We can model um, way the tides with the ocean. We can model sunrise and sunsets. We can model temperature. Temperature for the week. Oscillates. That means swings back and forth between 48 degrees and 74 degrees. If the low temperature occurs at 5 AM, when is it? 65 degrees. Well, if we think about the temperature then over the week, it's going to have a low temperature. Actually, we don't really need the midline. It's going to have a low temperature at 5 AM. It'll go up to a high temperature and down to another low temperature at 5 AM. And then it'll go up and down to another one at 5 AM. Which means the temperature was actually dropping for a while coming up to 5 AM. But we know that the high temperature is 74, and the low temperature is 48. If we average those together, 74 plus 48 divided by 2, that should tell us where the midline is. The midline happens at 61. So 61 is actually the midline of this graph. I don't know that this blue line actually ends right at the midline. It might be above it. We don't know where it starts and ends. Only thing we know is what happens at 5 AM. So if 61 is the midline, you notice that there's 13 up and 13 down. And so if we put that all together, we know that the midline is at 61 degrees. We know the amplitude now is at 13 degrees. We can figure out the period because a day is 24 hours. So we're going to call our x-axis 0 to 24, and 48 would be two days. So I guess these other 5 AM labels are off. But basically, at every 5 AM, it hits a minimum. 
So to find our b for our formula, we'll take 2 pi and divide by the 24 hours, which means pi over 12 is going to be the b. We also, this time, have a horizontal shift. Because we don't know where the graph actually starts. All we know is at 5 AM. So let's shift over 5 and call this a negative cosine. So it's going to shift right 5. And remember, horizontal shifts are backwards, so it's going to be a minus 5. And we're going to use a negative cosine to show that it starts at the bottom and works up from that horizontal shift. So if we put that all together, f of theta is equal to the amplitude, 13, but it's going to be a negative 13 to represent the negative cosine of the b pi over 12 times theta minus 5. That gives us the horizontal shift 5 to the right plus 61. This formula now, this function can now tell us the temperature at any given time of day theta. The problem is we have 65 degrees. We have the answer. We need to find the time of day. So we're going to plug that in for the f. So we have 65 equals negative 13 cosine of pi over 12 times theta minus 5 plus 61. And we're going to solve this equation to find out what time we hit that 65 degrees. Solving for cosine, we'll subtract 61 from both sides. That's going to give us 4 equals negative 13 cosine of pi over 12 times theta minus 5. Divide by the negative 13, we get negative 4 over 13 equals the cosine of pi over 12 times theta minus 5. We can do the cosine inverse again, still in radians, because our period came from 2 pi, which is the unit circle. So we'll do a cosine inverse of negative 4 over 13. And that gives us 1.88 is equal to the pi over 12 times theta minus 5. But again, I have to think about my unit circle when I do that cosine inverse. 1.88 is off to the left. There's going to be another x coordinate that's exactly the same down below it. So we know the entire first angle is 1.88. which means the obtuse angle below it is also 1.88. So we could do 2 pi minus 1.88 will take us back to the angle we want. So 2 pi minus 1.88 is also equal to pi over 12 times theta minus 5. And so if I do that on my calculator, 2 pi minus 1.88, we get about 4.40. So 4.4 is the other time, pi over 12 times theta minus 5. Scrolling down to get us a little more room then, we're going to solve both of these. Let's solve them one at a time. Starting with the left one, I'm going to multiply by 12 over pi on both sides. And when I do, 1.88 times 12 over pi is 7.18 equals theta minus 5. And adding 5 to both sides is 12.18. So 12.18 hours after midnight, the temperature rises to 65 degrees. But it keeps rising until it's high and comes back down. When does it hit 65 degrees again? Well, we'll multiply the second equation by 12 over pi. And when we do, we'll get 16.81 equals theta minus 5. 
And adding 5 to both sides gives us 21.81. So 21.81 hours after midnight, we also will hit our 65 degrees. The problem is we don't usually tell time in terms of decimal hours. So uh, with this first angle, 12.81, that's definitely 12 something PM. To get that something, we'll take the 0.18 times the 60 minutes in an hour. And that comes out to approximately 11 minutes. So we'll say at about 12.11 PM, we hit 65 degrees for the first time. The 21.81, that's almost in military time. If we subtract 12 hours off it, we get 9.81. So that tells me it's 9 something PM. To figure out the something, we'll take the 0.81 and multiply it by the 60 minutes. And that's about 49 minutes. At about 9.49 PM, the temperature seems to drop back down to 65 degrees. So we know between 12.11 PM and 9.49 PM, the temperature is above 65 degrees. All right, it's your turn to practice some of these now. We're taking a look at these applications of trigonometry where we can model them to make predictions about other moments in time. Take a look at some homework problems, practice a few of these, and let me know if you have any questions. Now that we've gotten really good with trig equations and we've gotten really good with trig identities, we're going to actually bring those two topics together to solve equations using identities. And that's going to derive our question for today. How do identities help solve trig equations? Let's take a look at some of the identities that we've seen so far that are important to us. We've seen um, what I'm going to call the tangent cotangent identity, which is basically that the tangent of theta is sine of theta divided by cosine of theta. And that cotangent, it's reciprocal is cosine of theta divided by sine of theta. We should have those two identities memorized already. And they're really reciprocals of each other. So there's really only one identity there, I guess. Then there's the reciprocal identities. And the reciprocal identities take a look at secant of theta is 1 divided by the cosine. Or you could flip that cosine is 1 over the secant. The cosecant of theta is 1 divided by the sine. Or you could flip that sine is 1 divided by cosecant. And the cotangent of theta is 1 divided by the tangent of theta. Or you could flip that and say tangent is 1 divided by cotangent. You should know those three identities as well by now. The other set of identities that you should know are called the Pythagorean identities. And the Pythagorean identities all come from the fact that sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta equals 1. If we divide all three terms by sine squared, you end up with 1 plus cotangent squared of theta equals cosecant squared of theta. Or if you divide the original equation by cosine squared, you end up with the tangent squared of theta plus 1 equals the secant squared of theta. And any of these three equations we can solve for any piece by subtracting off to the other side. But these three identities you should know by now as well. I'm going to add a fourth set of basic identities that you should know. These are called the negative angles. And you should be able to figure these identities out by drawing a quick picture to see what's happening. What I mean by that is if we have the sine of negative theta, and if I think about my unit circle here, 
we're going to have an angle of theta up. And that's going to give you an x comma y. But if I took negative theta, that would give you still x to the right, but negative y down, which means if we're doing the sine of negative theta, sine being the y coordinate gives us a negative y coordinate, or negative sine of theta. So with sine, the negative can come out. Similarly, with the reciprocal, uh, you'd see the same thing, which would be the cosecant of negative theta. It's just the reciprocal of sine, so that negative comes out secant, cosecant of theta. Very similar to those two is if we do the tangent of theta, negative theta. Tangent is y over x. So when I do tangent of negative theta, we get negative y over x, which is just a negative tangent of theta. Similarly with the cotangent of negative theta, because it's just the reciprocal, that reciprocal behaves just the same, bringing the negative out, cosine of theta. So with sine, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent, we see the negative just can float in or out of the function. But cosine of negative theta, you'll notice cosine being the x-coordinate, up or down, the x-coordinate is exactly the same. So actually, the cosine of a negative angle is the same as the cosine of the positive angle, which means the reciprocal will do the same thing. The secant of the negative angle is equal to just the secant of the positive angle. So with cosine and secant, the negative disappears inside. With everything else, the negative can float out or in depending on our situation. So I guess I've got six new identities for you today to keep track of. Really, there's three. But if you understand how that unit circle works, you can just draw a picture and derive each of these without having to actually memorize them, which is nice. So we're going to use those identities today as we solve trig equations. We're also going to use one extra strategy that we're going to steal from a long time ago, and that's the strategy of factoring. You remember if you had problems like 2x squared plus x equals 0, we could solve that by factoring out the greatest common factor of x, leaving behind 2x plus 1 equals 0. And then we could set each factor equal to 0, x equals 0 and 2x plus 1 equals 0, or x equals negative 1 half. And we'd have our two solutions for x. We can do much the same thing with trig. Just instead of x, you're now going to have a sine of our variable. Let's say you've got 2 sine squared of theta plus sine of theta equals 0. You'll notice that's exactly the same as the problem we just solved. Instead of x, we have sine of theta. So just like before, there's a common factor of sine. So we'll factor out the sine of theta. And that leaves behind 2 sine of theta plus 1 equals 0. And then we can set each factor equal to 0. The sine of theta equals 0, or the 2 sine of theta plus 1 equals 0. And solving that last one gives us the sine of theta equals negative 1 half. The only difference really is now we've got one more step as we do the inverse sine. And we just have to think about our unit circle. For this first function, sine of theta equals 0. We want the y coordinate to be 0. And the y coordinate is 0 on the left and on the right. So that's at 0 pi. 2 pi, 3 pi. You can see that's really just going to be k pi's. At every k pi's, we hit another solution. 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi. The sine is equal to 0. 
for the negative 1 half, the negative 1 half is going to be a little bit down on either side. That's going to happen at 11 pi over 6 or 7 pi over 6. And then again at every circle after that. So we end up with theta equals 7 pi over 6 plus 2 pi. And theta equals 11 pi over 6 plus 2 pi. And these all, oops, I forgot the k's, 2k pi. These all will represent the solutions to 2 sine squared theta plus the sine of theta. Now, quite often, we'll be given a domain restriction, like we just want to go from 0 to 2 pi. So if that's the case, theta would be equal to 0 pi, 7 pi over 6, and 11 pi over 6. And so in this way, factoring can help us solve trig equations as well. Let's do one more example before we bring it together with the identities. Let's do 3 secant squared of theta minus 5 secant of theta minus 2 equals 0. Well, this is really just a trinomial equal to 0. 3 secant squared is 3 secant theta times secant theta. 2 is 2 times 1. And if we put it, the 1 with the 3 and the 2 with the secant, we can put the 2 as negative, gives us negative 6, plus 1 is negative 5. And then we can set each equal to 0 and solve so that the secant of theta is equal to negative 1 third, or the secant of theta is equal to 2. And then we just have to figure out what angles do that. Well, remember, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So let's flip these over. Cosine of theta is equal to the reciprocal negative 3. And cosine of theta is equal to the reciprocal of 2, which is 1 half. Now, something to be aware of, Cosine, if we think about its graph, is oscillating between negative 1 and positive 1. It never goes bigger than negative 1 and positive 1. So it's never going to actually equal negative 3. But it can equal 1 half if we think about our unit circle. Cosine, we want a short x coordinate of 1 half. So it's going to be up above or down below, which happens at pi over 3 or 5 pi over 3. So theta is equal to pi over 3 plus 2k pi's, or 5 pi over 3 plus 2k pi's. And we have all the possible solutions to this function. If I wanted to do it just on 0 to 2 pi, then we'd only have theta equal to pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. And we've got our solution. All right. So we're combining two things today. We've talked about a bunch of identities. We've done a review of factoring and looked at how it can work with our solving trig equations. Let's try and bring it all together where we solve with properties. Let's solve the equation 2 sine squared theta minus cosine theta equals 1 on 0 to 2 pi. The problem with this function is we cannot factor it. We can set it equal to 0, 2 sine squared theta minus cosine theta minus 1 equals 0. But we can't factor it because the sine squared doesn't match the cosine. It would be nice if we could change sine squared into a cosine. 
And that's where the Pythagorean identity of sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1 is helpful. We can solve for the sine squared by subtracting cosine squared of theta from both sides. So I'm going to replace sine squared with 1 minus cosine squared. That'll give me 2 times 1 minus cosine squared theta minus the cosine of theta minus 1 equals 0. And now with a little simplifying by distributing, 2 minus 2 cosine squared theta minus cosine theta minus 1 equals 0. Combine the like terms, negative 2 cosine squared of theta minus cosine of theta plus 1 equals 0. Don't like to factor with a negative, so we'll multiply everything by negative 1 on both sides. Positive 2 cosine squared theta plus cosine theta minus 1 equals 0. And now we have something that we can factor and solve because we use that Pythagorean identity. Factoring, we have 2 cosine theta times cosine theta. 1 is 1 times 1. We'll make the, plus one, the cosine plus 1 positive, the 2 cosine minus 1, make that one negative so that the middle term comes out correct. And then we know that the cosine of theta is equal to 1 half, or the cosine of theta is equal to negative 1. We're just going from 0 to 2 pi, so we don't have to worry about multiple rotations around the circle. Cosine is 1 half. We actually just saw cosine being 1 half. We know that that's the short distance to the right, up and down. That's going to happen at pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. Also, we want cosine to be negative 1. That happens over here on the left at pi. And so all of our answers for theta are pi over 3, pi, and 5 pi over 3. Let's try one more problem where we have to use the trig identities in order to solve. And then we'll set you free to practice some of these, because that's the best way to get good at these. Practice, practice, practice. We're going to say the tangent of theta is equal to 3 sine of theta. And we're going to solve it on 0 to 2 pi, just one revolution of the circle. This one might not be obvious at first, but one thing we know is tangent is the same as sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta equals 3 sine theta. Now we've got something we can work with. I'd clear the fraction first by multiplying by the cosine of theta. So we have the sine of theta equals 3 sine theta cosine theta. Set it equal to 0 so we can factor. 3 sine of theta cosine of theta minus sine theta equals 0. And now we're ready to solve this function, this equation, by factoring. We have sines and cosines together, but that's OK because we can factor out the sine of theta, which leaves behind 3 cosine of theta minus 1. Setting each factor equal to 0, we have the sine of theta equals 0 or the cosine of theta equals 1 third. That first equation is nice because we know the sine of theta, the y coordinate, is 0 on the right and on the left. So that's going to happen at 0 and pi. Our other one, though, says cosine is equal to 1 third. That's not one of our key angles. It's positive, so we know it's somewhere off to the right, which means it's going to have a similar angle down below it with the same x-coordinate. 
But we're going to have to use our calculator to help us determine what is that angle. So on the calculator, I'm going to do a quick cosine inverse of 1 third. That's going to be 1.23, let's call it 1. 1.231. The other angle is going to be 2 pi minus the 1.231. And if I do that on my calculator, 2 pi minus 1.231, 5.052 becomes that other angle. So for our final answer for our angles, it happens at 0, at 1.231 radians, at pi radians, and at 5.052 radians. And we've got our last solutions. So that's what we're working on today, reviewing your trig identities, which you should know all of these very well by now, or at least be able to derive them. Review of how factoring can help us solve functions and putting that all together to solve with these properties. So go ahead and take a look at practicing some of these. Practice as many as you can. The more you practice, the better you will get at them. And let me know if you have any questions. This video is going to attempt to find some new identities around sums, differences, and products that are very useful to us as we simplify trig equations. These trig identities you do not need to memorize, but you should be definitely aware of them and how to use them. So we're going to find a couple new trig identities. So we'll answer the question, what are some sum difference and product identities. And the first identity we're going to call the sum and difference identities. And to set these up, we're going to start with uh, our unit circle. And I'm going to put a point on it up here. We'll call that p. And a point over here we'll call q. And it opens up to p and opens up to q. We'll call the big angle with p alpha. And the small angle with q we'll call beta. And we also know that then if point p has angle alpha, cosine will give the x-coordinate. So the cosine of alpha is the x-coordinate. And sine will give the y-coordinate, so the sine of alpha. Similarly with point q, cosine of the beta angle will give the x-coordinate. And sine of the beta angle will give the y-coordinate. And if I was interested in the angle that goes from p to, I'll call the origin O, to Q, that is going to be the difference between the alpha angle minus the beta angle. So if we opened up alpha and cut off the beta at the bottom, it just gives us that angle in between them. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take that blue-looking triangle. We'll go ahead and connect this line P to Q. I'm going to take that blue triangle, and I'm going to rotate that blue triangle so that it rests on the x-axis. And so now it's a smaller triangle. So it's probably going to be in the first quadrant now. It looks kind of like an acute angle. We'll call this C um, to the origin and D. And this triangle is the exact same triangle. I've just rotated it. And so what we know then is C will have an x coordinate of our angle. It's the same angle. It's the same POQ angle, which means its angle is alpha minus beta. 
So therefore, the cosine of alpha minus beta will give us the x-coordinate of c. And the sine of alpha minus beta will give us the y-coordinate of c. d is nice and easy, though, because d is directly to the right on the unit circle. It's 1 comma 0. What I need to notice about these two triangles, even though I didn't draw them the same size, they're supposed to represent the same triangle, just shifted over. On these triangles, the line C D is going to be congruent or equal to the line PQ. So let's look at both PQ and CD using the distance formula. The distance formula comes from the Pythagorean theorem. It's the square root of the x's squared plus the square root of the y squared. And so we can take the square root of both sides. And we find out that side CD is equal to the square root of the difference in the x's, which is going to be the cosine of alpha minus beta minus 1, all of that squared, plus the difference in the y's. That's going to be the sine of alpha minus beta plus 0 squared. Let's play with this a bit before we get to PQ. Let's go ahead and multiply that out. So we've got the square root of squaring the first binomial. It's going to be cosine squared of alpha minus beta minus 2 times the cosine of alpha minus beta plus 1. Plus, we have a sine squared of alpha minus beta. Now, what you might notice in that is we have a sine squared plus cosine squared, which together equal 1. So if sine squared plus cosine squared equal 1, and we add another 1 to that, together we've got 2, 1 plus 1, and then still the minus 2 cosine of alpha minus beta. So that's our CD line. Let's look at PQ and do much the same thing with the PQ line. So PQ, using the distance formula, is equal to the square root of the difference in the x's, cosine of alpha minus the cosine of beta squared, plus the difference in the y's, sine of alpha minus the sine of beta squared. If we multiply all of that out, we end up with the square root of cosine squared alpha minus 2 cosine alpha cosine beta plus cosine squared beta plus sine squared alpha minus 2 sine alpha sine beta. I'm running out of room, so I'm going to write a little below it, plus sine squared of beta. But again, you'll notice we have cosine squared of alpha and sine squared of alpha. That adds up to 1. We have cosine squared of beta and sine squared of beta. That adds up to 1. So what we end up with is the square root of 1 plus 1 is 2 minus 2 cosine alpha cosine beta minus 2 sine alpha sine of beta. Well, we said at the beginning that these two lengths, CD and PQ, are equal to each other, which means these two distances must be equal to each other. Let's see what happens when we play with that fact then. Let's square both sides. Let's switch colors and go back to blue. Square both sides. 
That gets rid of the square roots. So we have 2 minus 2 cosine of alpha minus beta equals 2 minus 2 cosine alpha cosine beta minus 2 sine alpha sine beta. What I want to notice is both sides of this equation have a 2 on them. So I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides. And that leaves us with negative 2 cosine of alpha minus beta equals negative 2 cosine of alpha cosine of beta minus 2 sine of alpha sine of beta. And then finally, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 2 all the way across. And this will give us our first formula. We call these sum and difference formulas because it's going to start with the difference. The cosine of alpha minus beta, if I'm subtracting two angles inside the cosine, that is equal to the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus the sine of the first angle plus, sorry, negative divided by a negative is a positive, plus the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. This is our first sum and difference formula. It's actually a difference formula because it's cosine. All of that coming from the two triangles being the same. We can actually have four of these sum and difference formulas, but really they come from what we did up above. If I were to let beta equal negative gamma, and I'll call this equation 1, in equation 1, the formula changes. The formula becomes the cosine of alpha minus, now that's negative gamma, equals the cosine of alpha cosine of, now that's negative gamma, plus the sine of alpha sine of, now that's negative gamma. We know in the first cosine minus a negative means we add the positive. In the middle, the cosine of a negative is the same as the cosine of a positive. And at the end, the sine of a negative, we can pop that negative out in front. And so when we put that together, we get our second formula. This time, it's a sum, cosine of alpha plus gamma is equal to the cosine of the first angle times the cosine of the second angle minus, this time, the sine of the first angle times the sine of the second angle. And that is how we can take the cosine of a sum, in this case, or a difference in equation 1, and split it up to individual sines and cosines of the individual angles. Going back to that first equation, what if I let alpha equal pi over 2 minus delta in equation 1? Now we've got the cosine of alpha, which is pi over 2 minus delta minus beta, equals the cosine of pi over 2 minus delta times the cosine of beta plus the sine of pi over 2 minus delta times the sine of beta. If you remember from our graphs of sine and cosine, the graph of sine started at 0 and shifted around. The graph of cosine started at 1 and shifted around. The key points of those graphs only differ from each other by the amount of pi over 2. They've shifted 
pi over 2 every time. All of the points have shifted pi over 2. So pi over 2 minus an angle will give us the opposite trig function. So where I see cosine of pi over 2 minus delta minus beta, I could think about that as pi over 2 minus delta plus beta, shifts cosine pi over 2, we end up with the sine of delta plus beta equals when the cosine gets shifted pi over 2, it becomes the sine of delta cosine of beta. Probably don't need those parentheses anymore. Plus, when sine gets shifted by pi over 2, it becomes the cosine of delta times the sine of beta. And so this then becomes our third function, a sine of a sum is equal to the sine of the first angle times the cosine of the second plus the cosine of the first angle times the sine of the second. And yes, we have a difference formula for sine as well. We're going to build it in much the same way we built that cosines. We're going to let beta equal negative epsilon, as we're working through our Greek alphabet today, in equation number 3. When we do that, we get the sine of delta plus a negative epsilon equals the sine of delta cosine of a negative epsilon plus the cosine of delta sine of negative epsilon. Well, adding a negative is the same as saying delta minus epsilon. So that's going to give us the subtraction we want. A negative inside a cosine is the same as a positive inside a cosine. And a negative inside a sine can come out, making the whole thing negative. And this is going to give us our fourth sum and difference, that the sine of delta minus epsilon is equal to the sine of delta times the cosine of epsilon minus the cosine of delta sine of epsilon. And so if we have the sine of a difference, it's equal to the sine of the first cosine of the second minus cosine of the first sine of the second. And that completes our four sum and difference formulas. We're going to play with these four sum and different formulas to create another set of identities called the product to sum identities. First, we're going to start with the sine of alpha plus beta, which I've changed the Greek letters, but it's the same formula as above. That's the sine of alpha cosine of beta plus the cosine of alpha sine of beta. And we're going to compare it with the sine of alpha minus beta which is equal to the sine of alpha cosine of beta minus the cosine of alpha sine of beta. And what's interesting is what happens when we add these two functions together. When we add these two functions together, on the left, we get the sine of alpha plus beta plus the sine of alpha minus beta. But on the right, we have like terms, so we get 2 sine alpha cosine beta. But the last part subtracts out to 0. And if I divide both sides by 2 to clear out that 2 and switch the order of the equation, we're going to write that the sine of alpha times the cosine of beta is equal to that divide by 2 I'm going to write as a 1 half 
sine of alpha plus beta plus the sine of alpha minus beta. And this becomes our first product to sum identity. If I multiply in a sine times a cosine, we can use this formula to rewrite them as two sines with the sum and the difference. And we can do much the same process to get all of the combinations of sine times cosine, cosine times sine, cosine times cosine, and sine times sine. For example, if we did the cosine of alpha plus beta, we know from up above in section A that that's the cosine of alpha cosine of beta minus the sine of alpha sine of beta. And we can add to it the cosine of alpha minus beta which we know is now the cosine of alpha cosine of beta plus the sine of alpha sine of beta. And when we add those together, we end up with cosine of alpha plus beta plus cosine of alpha minus beta is equal to two of these cosine alphas cosine betas. And the last part adds to 0. Divide by 2, and I'm going to switch the order that we write it. We'll put the right side first. Cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta is 1 half of the cosine of alpha plus beta plus the cosine of alpha minus beta. And that is our second of three product to sum identities. Let's take a look at a third. We've got sine cosine, which is the same as cosine sine. We've got cosine cosine. Now we need sine sine. We're going to look pretty similar to what we did last time, but I'm going to start with cosine of alpha minus beta. And we're going to this time subtract cosine of alpha plus beta. Let's see what that gives us. So on top, cosine of alpha minus beta is the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta plus the sine of alpha times the sine of beta. Alpha plus beta is the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta minus the sine of alpha sine of beta. And I said we're going to subtract these. I'm going to distribute that negative through. And when we do, we get the cosine of alpha minus beta minus the cosine of alpha plus beta is equal to. This time, the middle terms will subtract out. And we have two of these sine alphas, sine betas. There's our sine sine. We just need to divide by 2 to get our final product to some formula. Switching the order again, sine alpha sine beta is equal to 1 half times the cosine of alpha minus beta minus the cosine of alpha plus beta. And this becomes our third product to sum identity. So we've looked at how we can add sines and cosines. We've looked at how we can change products into sums. We're going to go the other direction for our last set of identities. We're going to look at how we can change sums to products. And actually, we're going to use the formulas we just saw. For example, we know now that the sine of alpha times the cosine of beta opposite trig functions is 1 half times the sine of alpha plus beta plus the sine of alpha minus beta. And we're going to do a little substitution with this formula. We're going to let u equal alpha plus beta and v equal alpha minus beta. 
And adding those together tells me u plus v is equal to two alphas, or that alpha is u plus v divided by two. Similarly, if I had subtracted them, u is equal to alpha plus beta, v is equal to alpha minus beta. If I subtract them, which is going to change all the signs, we get u minus v equals 2 betas. And dividing by 2 gives us u minus v divided by 2 is equal to beta, which means we can rewrite our formula as the sine of alpha, which is u plus v divided by 2, times the cosine of beta, which is u minus v divided by 2, is equal to 1 half of the sine of alpha plus beta, which is u, plus the sine of alpha minus beta, which is just v. And because we're going to try and avoid that fraction, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 to clear the fraction. And this will give us our first sum to product identity we get that 2 sine of u plus v divided by 2 cosine of u minus v divided by 2 is equal to sine of u plus the sine of v. I probably should have written that the opposite direction, because normally we start with the sum of two sines and change it to the product of a sine and cosine. We're going to call this equation 1. Actually, for clarity, we've already got a 1, 2, 3, 4. So let's call this equation 5. Because I'm going to refer to that here in number 2. I'm going to let v equal negative w. When I do that, the formula up above, I'm going to do that in number 5. When I do that, the formula up above now becomes 2 sine of u plus negative w over 2, cosine of u minus negative w over 2 equals the sine of u plus the sine of now negative w. And what's nice about this is we know plus a minus is the same as subtract. Minus a minus is the same as add. And a negative inside a sign can come out as a negative. And you put that all together, and we're going to get our difference formula. That 2 sine of u minus w over 2 times cosine of u plus w over 2 equals the sine of u minus the sine of w. And that becomes our second, this time a difference to product formula. Well, we've got the sum and difference of sine. We just have to create the sum and difference of cosine. And we're going to do it in much the same way we built those first two. We're going to start with the fact that we know the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta is 1 half times the cosine of alpha plus beta plus the cosine of alpha minus beta. And again, we're going to let u, I'll do this in blue, let u equal alpha plus beta. V is alpha minus beta. Adding them together will give us u plus v equals 2 alphas. Dividing by 2 tells us that alpha is u plus v divided by 2 again. Very similar, we're going to let u equal alpha plus beta v equal alpha minus beta. And this time, we're going to subtract which changes all the signs. 
u minus v is 2 beta. Divide by 2, beta is u minus v divided by 2, just like last time. But this time, we have cosines instead of sines. So we end up with the cosine of alpha, which is u plus v divided by 2, times the cosine of beta, which is u minus v divided by 2, equals 1 half times the cosine of alpha plus beta, which we know is just u, plus the cosine of alpha minus beta, which is just v. And then we like to clear that fraction by multiplying both sides by 2 to get our third formula that 2 cosine of u plus v over 2 times cosine of u minus v over 2 is equal to the cosine of u plus the cosine of v. Now we've got our cosine plus cosine changing into a product. We have one left. What we did last time to find the difference is we just made the last variable negative because we could pull it out of the sign. It would become sine minus sine. With cosine just making it negative, that doesn't quite work because the cosine of a negative is the positive cosine of the positive. So instead, we're going to use another one of our product formulas. We're going to start with sine of alpha sine of beta equals 1 half cosine of alpha minus beta minus the cosine of alpha plus beta. And again, we're going to let u equal alpha plus beta, v equal alpha minus beta. And I'm not going to do it again. It's exactly the same as the last two times that we did it. Alpha is equal to u plus v over 2. And beta becomes u minus v over 2. So that when we substitute, we get the sine of alpha which is u plus v over 2, times the sine of beta, which is u minus v over 2, is equal to 1 half times the cosine of alpha minus beta, which is u, minus the cosine of alpha plus beta, which is v. And again, we'll multiply by 2 to get 2 sine of u plus v over 2 times the sine of u minus v over 2 is equal to the cosine of u minus the cosine of v. And that becomes our next formula. So we've talked about a lot of formulas and where they come from in this video.